So there was a question earlier about what happens as you overly test against simulations. Uh, and this is a great paper that shows Los Carlos, what can happen. This is two minute papers with Caro Jona y Fahir. In this project, OpenAI built a hide and seek game for their AI agents to play. While we look at the exact rules here, I will note that the goal of the project was to pit two AI teams against each other and hopefully see some interesting emergent behaviors. And boy, did they do some crazy stuff. The coolest part is that the two teams compete against each other, and whenever one team discovers a new strategy, the other one has to adapt. Kind of like an arms race situation, and it also resembles generative adversarial networks a little. And the results are magnificent, amusing, weird. You'll see in a moment. These agents learn from previous experiences, and to the surprise of no one, for the first few million rounds, we start out with pandemonium. Everyone just running around aimlessly. Without proper strategy and semi-random movements, the seekers are favored and hence win the majority of the games. Nothing to see here. Then, over time, the hiders learned to lock out the seekers by blocking the doors off with these boxes and started winning consistently. I think the coolest part about this is that the map was deliberately designed by the OpenAI scientists in a way that the hiders can only succeed through collaboration. They cannot win alone, and hence, they are forced to learn to work together, which they did quite well. But then, something happened. Did you notice this pointy, doorstop-shaped object? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, probably, and not only that, but about 10 million rounds later, the AI also discovered that it can be pushed near a wall and be used as a ramp, and ta-da, got him. The seeker started winning more again. So the ball is now back on the court of the hiders. Can you defend this? If so, how? Well, these resourceful little critters <laughs> learned that since there is a little time at the start of the game when the seekers are frozen, apparently during this time they cannot see them, so why not just sneak out, steal the ramp, and lock it away from them? Absolutely incredible. Look at those happy eyes as they are carrying that ramp. And you think it all ends here? No, no, no. Not even close. It gets weirder. Much weirder. When playing a different map, the seeker has noticed that it can use a ramp to climb on the top of a box, and this happens. Do you think couch surfing is cool? Give me a break. This is box surfing. And the scientists were quite surprised by this move, as this was one of the first cases where the seeker AI seems to have broken the game. What happens here is that the physics system is coded in a way that they are able to move around by exerting force on themselves, but there is no additional check whether they are on the floor or not, because who in their right mind would think about that? As a result, something that shouldn't ever happen does happen here. And we are still not done yet. This paper just keeps on giving. A few hundred million rounds later, the hiders learned to separate all the rams from the boxes. Dear fellow scholars, this is proper box surfing defense. Then lock down the remaining tools and build a shelter. Note how well rehearsed and executed this strategy is. There is not a second of time left until the seekers take off. I also love this cheeky move where they set up the shelter right next to the seekers and I almost feel like they are saying, yeah, see this here? There's not a single thing you can do about it. In a few isolated cases, other interesting behaviors also emerge. For instance, the hiders learn to exploit the physics system and just chuck the ramp away. <laughs> After that, the seekers go, what? What just happened? But don't despair. And at this point, I would also recommend that you hold on to your papers because there was also a crazy case where a seeker also learned to abuse a similar physics issue and launch itself exactly <laughs> onto the top of the hiders. Man, what a paper. This system can be extended and modded for many other tasks too, so expect to see more of these fun experiments in the future. We get to do this for a living, and we are even being paid for this. I can't believe it. In this series, my mission is to showcase beautiful works that light a fire in people. 
And this is, no doubt, one of those works. Great idea, interesting, unexpected results, crisp presentation. Bravo OpenAI, love it. So, did you enjoy this? What do you... So, yeah, that's a video I often like to show. Make sure to leave a... <clears throat> right, because essentially what the AI is doing is that it, it learns, you know, an exploit in the physics system, right? It's not intended to be how the game was designed. Uh, it's essentially a bug in the code. Um, and so I don't know if you noticed, but it, they're talking about hundreds of millions of, of, of games later that it's, just, it's uh, <clears throat> finding these things. And it has to do with a concept that we'll talk about in the uh, later this afternoon about exploration, right? So in reinforcement learning, we are, uh, gaining from experience, but uh, um, we have to have this notion about exploration to try things uh, at random or try new things to understand, well, what is the payoff from that? So essentially at some point uh, through random exploration, uh, the, um, you know, the AI ran up that ramp and got launched into the air and said, oh, this worked. Uh, let me try that again. And, and it's just because it, it's, you know, just random. That's why it takes hundreds of millions of exploit uh, of 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 trials to to come across that. But from a testing perspective, if we're looking at simulations, um, you know, we have to like the it's showing the power of the algorithm versus what we intended it to do. Um, so something always we need to uh, be considerate of. Um, so going back to some other things from uh, the. Uh, first lecture or the lecture before lunch. Um, right. So I reran, uh, actually I'd, I was using, uh, uh, some poor coding practices and it pulled this from another notebook and, uh, ran it and didn't really look at, didn't look at all my names, but I'd forgotten that I'd renamed the model that I trained on, uh, the, the segment and data set. Um, so if you have this, this Jupyter notebook, know that, um, that's what's going on here. But, uh, when I ran it on, uh, I, I changed the variable names and uh, ran it on this data set. Uh, and what we can see from the results is that um, we get, I don't know if you remember, but it was basically 90, 90, 70. Uh, and so what we see, right, is that the, uh, the, the regression tree completely breaks, uh, right? It has a root mean squared error of 280. Uh, can't adapt at all uh, to this change in the, um, uh, in the environment. The random forest is still tree-based. We have an ensemble method. It, it performs a lot worse, but the linear regression model is pretty much robust, right? Um, so there's a small change in performance, but ultimately um, yeah, was able to adapt. So um, just a, a, a little demonstration about, uh, you know, how, how simply choosing, you know, different training splits, um, you know, uh, maybe making a poor decision about, you know, uh, uh, time series data not accounting for non-stationarity uh, can affect the results and, and the conclusions. Um, so, um, most of what we're going to focus on is is unsupervised learning, but I got a couple of advanced topics in the supervised learning realm to discuss first. Um, and really, if if there's anything I want you to take away from uh, today in supervised learning, it's the uh, the importance of labels and getting that, that target. Um, cause all of these algorithms really depend upon that. Uh, we need large data sets labeling things, for example, like, you know, to train a computer vision model, so, uh, somebody has got to go in and draw all those, uh, um, uh, bounding boxes on images. Um, you know, that's a kind of a, a low skill, um, uh, uh, task, but doing something like, you know, uh, adjudicating like uh, bugs in code or, or cyber attacks. I mean, that is, uh, you know, a very, uh, uh, um, I would say expensive uh, process. Um, so, um, you know, acquiring the, uh, the data sets that are required to train these, these models can often be um, a, an extremely big hurdle to implementing them. Um, and what I find is, is also one of the limitations to, uh, implementing these in, in different research projects, which is like, yeah, we have a great idea how to solve a problem. How are we ever going to get this data? Um, or, or even and not just, uh, uh, how are we going to get the data, but maybe even we have data, but is it the right data? Is it labeled correctly? Um, 
I told you I've done a lot of work in condition monitoring. I've talked with clients that said, I collected data for years. Here it all is. And I was like, well, nobody ever wrote down like, what's the failure? Why did these things break? Was this really, you know, so yeah, you collected all this data, but was it the right data? Not really. Um, so, you know, and most of the, the, the cost uh, is associated with labeling. Um, can be time consuming, difficult, require experts. Um, so what most of these advanced topics uh, and the things that I think about in my research are, well, how do I get around this? Or how can I, um, you know, design models? How can I build it into the algorithm that maybe I don't need as much data or, or, or um, um, uh, accurately labeled data? And one, one uh, area that I've worked in a little bit is called active learning. Uh, and so this is where you iteratively label a data set. Uh, and so we just go around this loop where M is a model. Or we have L, which is a small labeled data set. Um, you know, we can build a model uh, on uh, the small uh, data set. Uh, we can use an active learning selection procedure. And there's a number of different ways to do this to say, to look at our unlabeled data set uh, and decide which ones do we, would we like an Oracle to label for us. Um, and there's a number of ways that we can do this. You can look at like maybe the one of the most basic is looking at uncertainty of the model saying, or, or like, you know, if you think about like, if you have models that show you something about decision boundaries, like give me something that's close to the decision boundary, pass it to an Oracle, label it, uh, and then add it to your label data set, retrain the model and, and keep moving forward. So we've done some work. Uh, we did this uh, with uh, static analysis. Static analysis is, you know, uh, uh, you might not know that this, uh, uh, you know, you might not know what aesthetic analysis, but, you know, if you're using an IDE and you're, or some other thing where you're writing code and all of a sudden it's starting to highlight sections that it thinks are wrong or, uh, you know, maybe incomplete lines, uh, this is basically static analysis. So it looks at code, tries to find errors in the code, bugs in the code uh, without actually running it. Um, so uh, uh, a group at SEI, uh, at, at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, showed that machine learning could be used to identify um, or basically triage the output of static analysis uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, and they had to do a massive amount of collecting um, uh, uh, data and labeling data because the you know, static analysis basically has a very high, say, false alert uh, uh, rate, right? It tells you a whole lot of things and they're not really important. If you have multiple tools, um, you know, how do I decide which one of these do I actually need to go fix? Because if you think about it operationally, everyone, every uh, alert that a static analysis tool puts out, somebody has to go into the code and adjudicate it, decide whether or not to fix it. So can we use machine learning to triage this process? Um, and they trained a huge data set uh, and showed that we could do it. Um, but when we tried to move to other things, the question was, well, how do we, uh, how could we um, uh, streamline this process or maybe even integrate it into the workflow? So not just like, well, do I want to give you something that, you know, if, if this is being deployed in an operational environment, um, when I give an Oracle who's, you know, an expert, uh, uh, an observation, an alert and say, please label this for me. I would also like them you know, to be something that if it's fixed is really important to us. Um, so, um, yeah, trying to, to, um, uh, I would say balance the trade-off between get, having them perform work to give us a label that improves the algorithm versus uh, something that if they find it and they can go fix it, it's really important. Um, so that, that was in another paper. What we showed here is just simply by um, uh, implementing active learning, we could significantly reduce the number of, of um, label training uh, instances that we needed. So uh, we did this on some open source data uh, that had like flaws uh, already highlighted I think it was like the, the original data set was like 60,000 and we showed that we could get, um, I can't remember. I think this is accuracy in the, in the low nineties or you know, somewhere just above that, like 93%, right. We could accurately label whether or not, you know, the, the presence or severity of a flaw. Um, and that was training the entire, you know, data set of 60,000. Um, and what we show here is that if we label the, um, uh, observations in a, a, an intelligent way and sequentially add them, we could reduce it to just a couple hundred. I think we start off with zero. You know, this is the number of queries. So this is how many times we're asking an, uh, an Oracle to label stuff. I think we started out, I don't know, a couple hundred in the original set, but just by smartly labeling, we get very close to optimal, you know, to what we consider optimal performance on the entire data set. So, um, active learning is one advanced topic. Um, 
there's a whole lot of different um, methods that combine, you know, uh, semi semi supervised learning is uh, you know having a combination of of unsupervised and supervised data, uh, using that to improve your model. Uh, weekly supervised can be well, what if my labels are bad? What if there's error? Um, or, or poorly labeled. Uh, so thinking back to the faults, um, uh, the condition monitoring, uh, well, what if I only have fault or non-fault? Uh, for a lot of them, I don't have maybe down to the data. So this is actually a hierarchical model that we did on the uh, uh, hydraulic actuator. Um, so you can see that we have at the, the top, we have fault or non-fault, and then we have a uh, damage type, and then we have damage severity. But what if, you know, our, our data set is uh, mixed with a number of different uh, uh, labeling schemes? We haven't tried that on this data. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, that, that's one thing that can happen, so having the mix of data. Uh, and then finally, multi-label. Um, so if we look at the hierarchical uh, model, um, you know, there's multiple labels that all could be true. Right? It could be a fault. It could be this damage type. It could be the severity. If you think about what I showed in computer vision, it could be, you know, fruit, apple, food, right? They get, there can be multiple labels. Um, so um, these are more advanced topics uh, that try to integrate a number of different uh, supervised learning techniques. Um, transfer learning is something I've talked about a little bit, um, but I think is uh, um, especially important for uh, non-stationary data or, or learning at scale from things. And this is essentially where um, you try to use information from one problem to help improve uh, another problem. So if we had, I'm just going to call them learning problems for right now, but you know, the traditional uh, machine learning approach on the left would be that I'd build a, a separate model for each one. But if they're related in some way and you can understand that relationship, I might be able to use data or or information is maybe a better term, not just data, from one uh, uh, problem and then transfer it to another. And it's usually in the case where I have a lot less examples uh, in this, what we call target uh, data set. Um, so yeah, this is something that uh, we're very interested in. This can be implemented in a number of different ways. It could be transferring data. It could be um, uh, uh, finding a projection of the data in a common space that makes everything the same or, or actually improving, um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> assuming that the uh, Oracle can provide uh, accurate labeling of the data set, does it render building a classifier trained on synthetically labeled data unnecessary, given that you already have a reliable method to classify the data? Well, I don't know. I guess I haven't really, ex you know, there's, there's a concept called self-supervised learning, and I haven't really experimented with that too much. Um, my, and that's where essentially you'd be building, you know, and that's a part of, so we go back to semi-supervised learning here. Uh, one of the strategies there is to build a model on your supervised data, uh, predict class labels on um, your unsupervised set, and then use that and, and update the model. Um, I don't know. I feel like it might be like adding bias in some way or some of the negative traits of your model, uh, but I haven't really experimented with that. Um, Really, the limitation to active learning. Also, uh, you know, model bias is a big issue with with active learning because you're not really, uh, you know, you're really starting to break that uh, IID assumption. Um, so, um, in practice, sometimes like those those active, there can be definitely downsides to it. Uh, there are papers that study that, but um, there are other sampling strategies that attempt to reduce the amount of bias in the model that you'll learn. So yeah, all these things have trade-offs. Um, you know, it kind of depends on um, uh, your, your, your application. Yeah. yeah. No? And then uh, one follow-up question. Uh, why is defining labels so challenging and how can we overcome those challenges? Well, um, it's not always challenging. It's just that it's, it's that acquiring them in, in a lot of applied, um, you know, getting them from a real system um, is extremely difficult. So if you think back to when I was talking about the hydraulic actuator, we built a test stand so we didn't have to go and collect uh, data and try to label it, right? So we're, we're turning knobs, we're, we're, we're giving it conditions, we have the label. Uh, now we invested heavily in that test stand. Um, you know, it took, I, I want to say six months to a year to build and perfect. Um, so it just depends maybe where do you want to, uh, um, 
um, I guess, you know, put effort. Uh, I guess I would also say that, you know, there's definitely probably bias if we're thinking about generalization error, right? We're biased towards um, specific faults and thought and, and, and actually faults that we thought we could engineer uh, uh, into the, uh, the test stand. So, um, but uh, yeah, sometimes labeling can be relatively easy, but there's a lot, you know, in my experience, um, we, we um, spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to, going to acquire the labels, right? So, right. Data can be easy, right? I can go out and instrument a system and just collect it. I can collect a lot of data, but uh, what I need to know is something about what am I trying to predict, um, which is often the, the, the more challenging part. So transfer learning, and uh, that's it for the, the supervised learning uh, lecture. Um, this is just a few topics, uh, advanced stuff, but there is an extremely wide range of research that's going on uh, on this topic. So um, now moving to um, unsupervised learning. So we talked about supervised learning where we have data that's pairs of our, our data or our, our features and our targets, whatever we're going to uh, um, uh, try to predict. Um, we have a loss function where we can uh, uh, quantify the difference between our model performance and the true value. Um, and uh, we want to learn a function that minimizes loss. Um, unsupervised learning, we don't have any of our labels. Um, uh, there's no target. Uh, there's no loss function. Uh, we need to develop new criteria for understanding the data. Um, and I guess I'll just say right up front that like this is um, – an extremely challenging field because um, it's really hard to evaluate the performance of your model to understand um, how to choose different um, uh, parameters. So if I'm trying to cluster things, like how many clusters are there? Um, and so this is really, really challenging. It can be hard for, for students and people starting off in the field to really understand how to do this because, you know, often in supervised learning, right, you can go define a loss function. I can just say, this is the best, you know, I calculate a whole bunch of root mean squared errors. Um, I think this model is the best, uh, but justifying an unsupervised model is, is extremely challenging. And this is where a lot of like nuance uh, comes in and understanding your data and ultimately what do you want it to use for, to be used for. Um, so generally there's kind of three um, uh, unsupervised techniques. There's clustering, uh, dimensionality reduction. So I'm going to try to take maybe all this data and try to represent it in a low dimensional space so I can learn something about it. Uh, then there's associate rule mining. I'm not really going to talk about that. That's why it started. Um, this has to do with learning about things like it's really uh, mostly where I've seen it applied is in like retail things. So if somebody is purchasing this item, uh, they might be more likely to associate this item. So you have data that's like, you know, these are all the items that were purchased by a person um, and so I want to start looking at rules about associations and things. So, uh, but I don't do a lot of that work. So, um, I, I think I've only, I think I've had one student group, um, um, implement associate role mining and that's it. So I'm gonna talk about clustering and then dimensionality reduction. Um, so what is clustering? If we have data that looks like this, what I want to do is learn some type of model. Oh, wait, you know what? I'm, I don't think I'm uh, displaying. So the people online, were they able to see? Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. Oh, okay. well, we'll keep going. Um, so I want to learn a model that does something like this. Maybe draws these circles or these ellipses. And uh, um, yeah, cluster the data like this, right? So here I've got you know some data. It's very easy. This is a very simple case of clustering. Um, where, uh, uh, it, it, you know, and we don't even maybe need a model to understand. We could probably draw this by eye. Uh, but this is what we want to do is to learn something about the data. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, probably one of the most basic clustering algorithms called k-means. This is a good place to start. Um, there's much more advanced things. But, um, you know, if you're talking about, like, uh, I don't know, something similar to, like, linear regression in terms of, like, where, where to start with clustering. So... The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take all my data and I'm going to define some type of distance metric here. I'm using like the L2 norm. Um, and I can, you know, talk about a distance between two, uh, uh, two, um, 
instances in my data set i and j. Uh, L is going to be the, the feature, right? So um, I'm summing over the distances between all the features. Uh, I'm going to assume K clusters, um, and I'm going to define some, some metrics about the within cluster scatter. So if I have a cluster K, uh, I'm going to take a learner parameter, uh, mu, which is essentially the, the mean of that cluster. Uh, and I, uh, the, the within cluster scatter is then for all the observations that are in cluster K, uh, what is the average distance um, um, from the mean? Um, so uh, what we want to do is uh, reduce that uh, uh, within scatter um, um, or within cluster scatter, right? So that essentially the idea is that I want to learn uh, these means. These are the only parameters of these algorithms that um, uh, make it so that the uh, within cluster scatter is minimized. Right, so if it's in a cluster, it's going to be the closest. You know, the mean that it's closest to is the cluster that it's assigned to, uh, and it's a really simple algorithm where uh, you know it's iterative, where you select k clusters to begin with, uh, you randomly assign uh, all your points to k, you calculate the means, and then you uh, um, uh, um, assign new clusters based on the mean, and then you just keep repeating. Right, so it's like well. Um, it, it, it's, it's really simple, right? So randomly assign points to clusters, calculate means, reassign points. And that's it. And this eventually converges. Um, so uh, why do I like this? Um, again, it's one of the most interpretable uh, clustering algorithms. So I took the clusters that we had earlier. I went on and color-coded them. And the stars here are uh, the means of these, uh, of these clusters learned by, by k-means. So this makes a lot of sense. This is with two clusters. One thing I want to point out, though, um, so first is that in this implementation, it actually does have a, um, a, a point assigned to the wrong cluster. Um, we can visually see that here. Um, if we had real data and maybe high-dimensional data, we, we maybe wouldn't be able to detect that. Again, that's a challenge uh, for these when, when you're evaluating them. So a lot of times, uh, honestly, what we do is we need when we're doing evaluation, we actually need supervised learning. We know that maybe the algorithms are going to be deployed in an unsupervised space where we're not going to be able to get data, but we're going to need, when we're evaluating and testing them, some type of labeled data. Um, so, yeah. Are you experimenting with using different distance functions for this algorithm? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch. Situations where you would, different distances would select for different uh, yeah. features in the, in the data. Yeah, you can use the, the rules of thumb for that. Like what? You know. mm, no, I usually just implement the the default. Um, maybe if there was some trait, maybe if, during my exploratory data analysis, if I saw some specific, um, uh, I don't know, trait, maybe I would change it. Or if I wanted to bias the algorithm in some way, yeah, L two norm seems to be like the the most basic. I think you could use like uh, they call it Manhattan distance, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it all kind of depends on the data. It's like a a, a tuning parameter. Um, so, right. So another tuning parameter for, for uh, k-means, right, is the number of clusters. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the distance metric can be another one. Yes, question online. Uh, can labeling data for evaluation be done post hoc? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you would want to maybe make sure that you're not biasing the labels based on your algorithm, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it absolutely could be done uh, after the, uh, the algorithm is learned or performed. Um, yeah. So we can get different distance metrics that might actually change the, maybe the, the, the technical name of the algorithm. But I think that if you go into the documentation for, for SK learn, you can define, or you can define a custom one, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So all those things, so all, all these, all loss functions, um, you know, I always, I consider them all under, uh, um, hyper parameters. Uh, but again, the question is, well, how do I evaluate that? Right. So if I change my distance metric, right, it's very easy in this case, right. Uh, where I have two dimensional data. Uh, but when I have, um, uh, more complex data, um, how do I evaluate that changing that distance metric? Um, improved my results in some way, which is the, the, one of the big challenges with this. I'll tell you, like when, when I'm teaching this stuff to students or uh, to maybe even people more, people more junior in their career, they have a really hard time understanding that I can't 
um, tell them uh, exactly what the optimal performance metric is. Um, so uh, another challenge is, yeah, how do we choose K? So I took this data, right? So this one, I, I tell it two clusters. So I, and I know that. Um, here, I gave it three clusters. Um, and, uh, you know, what it, you know, the algorithm is going to find what it finds, which is that it's going to, it's splitting up, uh, the, the top cluster into two different, um, um, into two different clusters, essentially. So, uh, you know, we can see from this example, we know that there's two clusters, but in reality, you might not know. Um, so that is a big, uh, limitation. How do we choose that? I, I think I have some examples later about some, Methods, um, you know, these would be the standard methods that you can maybe use. I honestly don't really like them too much um, and usually go by some other notion. Um, so some other issues is that, uh, yeah, K-means essentially assumes a, uh, a fixed variance for all the clusters um, where, um, yeah, and so if you need a model that, you know, wants to estimate the variance or you assume that there's variance, you know, the, the, the variance of the cluster is dependent upon the cluster. You can use a Gaussian mixture model, um, which is another, you know, which is a great model, but can have the same property here, which is that if I tell it to find four clusters, it's going to define four clusters. Um, and there's a lot of ways to, uh, um, that that can be problematic. Um, another thing is that, uh, K means uh, the, the the generic implementation is only for quantitative data. Um, so there's, uh, you know, versions called like K uh, metoids or, you know, there's, there's other versions that can handle um, um, uh, categorical data. Um, but usually I try to stick with it just uh, when I have quantitative data. I haven't tried the, or I don't remember really experimenting with um categorical data for something like this. I usually think of that as maybe not a clustering problem or maybe try to filter out that data. Yeah. Um, okay, so any questions about K-means? So uh, a little bit about, um, yeah, some methods for um, uh, evaluating the number of means. And one, one popular way is the, the what they call an elbow plot. Um, so here I've plotted the... Uh, within cluster sum of squares, the, the scatter essentially for um, uh, that data that I showed that as two clusters, you know, as I increase. Um, usually what you want to do is look for, you know, some type of, of, of drastic change in this plot. So for this one, uh, what I would say is that right around here at five clusters is where you see the elbow. Uh, but we know I implemented this on data that has two clusters. So um, I don't know how useful this really is. Uh, it's kind of a standard way, uh, you know, again, maybe it's, sometimes it's informative, um, but um, I don't like to rely maybe specifically on this. Um, another thing are these silhouette plots. Um, and so this is pretty hard, I think, to interpret. Um, but essentially what you want to do is look at. So right here, we can see this is the true clusters, right? There's two. And what we're seeing, so what a silhouette plot is, it, it looks at the distance between um, uh, essentially of all the data sets uh, to this cluster, right? So it's looking at all the da all the data points in this data set, it's distance to uh, a, a cluster. So when we see something like this, which we know is true, where it's balanced um, and, uh, um, or the cluster that it's assigned to, right? it's balanced and, and relatively even in, in a lot of, of a lot of the masses to the right of this line, which is like the average silhouette score, um, that seems pretty, usually what you want. Um, when I give it three clusters, now it's starting to have these smaller uh, um, clusters of data. Um, we can see that that cluster one is still, you know, has, has a lot of its mass to the right of um, of that dashed line, but the other two clusters don't, which is starting to say it's starting to get away from, from a good cluster. Um, again, I... You know, this is, you know, if you go read the uh, scikit-learn um, uh, documentation, they're going to say this is how you pick clustering or, or the number of clusters. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think, that, you know, we've looked at a lot of these for some other projects, and I think they're pretty difficult to, to interpret. Um, honestly, I think the best way is to think about the data set in the problem and try to find, like, natural clusters or at least some, you know, try to come up with some type of interpretation of your data that tells you something about 
um, uh, or there's some type of intuition about the clusters. Um, or it may be even a little bit uh, unintuitive is maybe to cluster and then try to interpret the cluster. So if I have something like k-means, um, go back in, look at those mean values, and then try to kind of extrapolate, right, back out some type of interpretation, maybe some type of label uh, about this. So I'll give an example, um, and I've got a paper out there uh, where we did this on on credit card fraud data. So we were looking at, um, you know, a bank's customer database uh and we were we clustered um their customers based on types of transactions uh and then eventually what we were able to do we used k-means uh, it was pretty simple but we were able to go back into those those means and say well this is a person that like you know primarily spends you know or does credit card transactions very close to their home this is somebody that goes all over the world this is somebody that does i can't remember you know primarily low high so we we didn't start off with a set number of clusters we kind of Look, we talked with them, try to understand, like, maybe what, you know, if you had to start grouping types of customers in your customer base, how many types do you think there would be? Um, we did a little bit of, of, of tuning, um, but ultimately that, you know, I think we settled on 10 or something. But ultimately what it came down to was, like, when, when I choose 10, can I then have 10, like, clusters that, that make sense? So uh, it was pretty challenging, but um, that's... I'll, Ultimately, one of the best ways, I think, of, of approaching this problem, yeah, using some type of domain knowledge to really define the, the clusters and the number. Um, so another clustering technique that, can, that is uh, pretty great, I'm not going to go into the details of this, which is uh, hierarchical clustering, where essentially we build a tree. Um, we can either go uh, bottom up, where we say, well, I'm going to start with um, every single observation in an individual cluster. And I'm going to then start grouping them based on the, the distance metrics, right? And say, okay, well, you know, the, you know, if I want to go up one label, one level, like these two are really close together. So I'm going to group them. And that's how you can build this tree. Uh, or you can go top down where you say, I'm going to start with everything in, um, uh, in a single cluster and I'll start to split it. Um, and so, uh, you know, this can be really interesting uh, because um, uh, again, very interpretable, uh, pretty easy to read. Actually the, the, um, uh, length of these like branches tells you something about uh, uh, maybe the strength of the clustering. So this is uh, called a dendrogram, um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's set up that way so that the uh, basically the y-axis, uh, which is labeled over there, you know, tells you something about how close everything in the clusters is. And then what I can do is I could decide I can use this to help pick clusters. Right. So if I wanted to pick like a value of forty, uh, right, I can say, well, you know, it's it very clearly separates into two clusters. Um, and now if I go down, like I'm not really getting that much of an advantage, right? So if I, I decrease the y-axis down to maybe like 25, I'll get three, but that that gap isn't really that big, right? So the, the length of this um, y-axis right there from two to three isn't, isn't really very significant. So um, these dendrograms are pretty useful for being able to to judge uh, or, or maybe try to help cluster. Um, but what I like about this is that it puts every observation into a cluster eventually. Um, and I guess in the, I think in the Jupyter notebook, I have some examples of this and we can start to interpret and say like, well, do these things make sense? Um, Cause right. So what happens is right. Is that uh, basically you're, you're ordering all of your observations. So if you look at labels, like, you know, the, the two that are really close down here together, you know, should be pretty similar. Um, so again, where I've done this was in, um, maybe we did this for some, some sports analytics stuff where we're analyzing different golfers. Um, and so we made a, a dendrogram about their, uh, you know, using statistics from the PGA, uh, showed it to, to some experts and they said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense that these two golfers are, you know, really play very similar, right? Um, you know, they have very similar styles or, they, or maybe we did it on golf courses or something like that, but, you know, it's very interpretable. Again, if you have a small data set. Oh, okay. So we're really on time. Yep. Uh, so dimensionality reduction. So um, a little bit different than feature selection. Feature selection, I want to get rid of features. Uh, dimensionality reduction, I want to reduce the feature set. So or reduce the or transform it into a lower dimensional space. Um, principle. I think there's a lot of stats people in here. So principal components. Yeah. Um, kind of canonical uh, dimensionality reduction technique. Um, 
So this can be interesting for a couple of ways. One, we are vastly increasing the, the data that we can um, collect, um, trying to plot that in some type of, of sensible way is very difficult, but if I can find a lower dimensional transformation in maybe two or three dimensions, I can plot the data and maybe start to understand stuff um, <clears throat> and maybe even understand what the, uh, um, you know, what the, what the clusters are from that lower dimensional space. Um, yeah, maybe using that lower dimensional space is a good uh, uh, input feature space for a uh, supervised model. Um, I like it for anomaly detection. So you project every, if you have like a really good transformation, you project it into a low dimensional space. Um, you know, you can see all your data kind of clus clusters together. Um, you know, as you're collecting more data, you keep projecting it. You see one that's way out uh, uh, in a different region of the space that you've, uh, you know, your other data hasn't seen before. Maybe it's an anomaly. Um, so again, though, it's very interpretable, right? So um, the size of the lower dimensional space, what makes up a good clustering in the lower dimensional space is all kind of up for debate. Um, so here's principal components. Um, I bet most people here are probably familiar with this. So, um, yeah, principal components. I think that this is on some data that we'll see later. Um, I think everybody's probably familiar with the math behind principal components. Yeah, it's optimization routine. I'm going to try to find a linear combination of my data that projects into a low dimensional space. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want to get to some more of the, the machine learning oriented things. Um, principal components is nice because you have a scree plot, which so, shows you something about the, the data uh, or the variance. Um, so here's some data that we'll see later, uh, which shows that basically, I don't know, I think 90 some percent 99% of the data can be explained by the first three principal components. So if we're trying to decide how many principal, you know, what's the lower dimensional space I want to project this into, right? I've got 22 dimensions. Uh, I'm characterizing the, the variance of each of these. Um, you know, three seems, and maybe even two, depending on what you want to do, uh, uh, seems like a pretty reasonable uh, um, uh, a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, one of the more, I would say, recent um, uh, dimensionality reduction methods is called T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Uh, TISNI is, is, is what uh, a lot of people call this. Um, so principal components is a, uh, a linear, uh, technique and it's deterministic, right? So each time you run principal components on the same data, it's going to give you the same, uh, result. Um, TISNI is nonlinear, but also it's not deterministic. Um, so there's a lot of uh, probabilistic, uh, flavor to this. Um, I would say it's pretty good at dimension. You know, it, it's, it is, um, pretty interesting. We'll see some implementations of it, but basically how it works is that, um, um, you, you calculate a similarity in the high dimensional space. Um, and you want to find a mapping that maps it into a low dimensional space that preserves the neighbors, right? So if something is close together in the high dimensional space, it needs to be close together in the low dimensional space. Um, and that's kind of the constraint when we do the mapping. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's probabilistic. Um, and, uh, so where's the problem? I think it comes from, uh, the labeling of the neighbors or, right. Yeah. So, um, there's a couple of different, uh, um, hyperparameters for this one is, you know, how many neighbors do we want to have? Um, and which can change the results. Uh, the mapping um, is probabilistic, right? So you, you, I think you're using gradient descent uh, and minimizing the di divergence between um, uh, the probability distributions in the high and low dimensions. Um, so um, it doesn't quite have, I would say, the the, the broad usefulness of, of principal components, um, but it can give you some pretty interesting things, especially when, if that, that mapping, right? The, the dimensionality reduction is, is nonlinear. So this was often actually really used a lot in, um, for, uh, summarizing documents. So you can think about, uh, right. So if you, all right. So for natural language processing, one way to represent a document is to take, um, every word that's in the document and, uh, turn that into a feature in your, um, uh, in your data set and, uh, count, or maybe even just indicate, 
uh, how many times that word uh, appears in the document. And you get a very wide, uh, well, I'd say wide data set, right? So it has a whole lot of different uh, uh, words uh, in your, your dictionary, uh, but it's very sparse. Um, but Tisney is pretty good at, at now projecting what does that data look like in some type of low dimensional space into the very high dimensional space and, and reduce it uh, and see where it lies. And you can look at, um, you know, maybe how close uh, in that low dimensional space are documents to each other. Um, so that's some of the work that I think that we've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then probably uh, I would say that, the, you know, there's a, um, you know, deep learning version, uh, a neural network version of, of um, dimensionality reduction. Um, the general framework is called an autoencoder. Uh, and so what do I want to do with an autoencoder is that I'm going to um, take my data X, I'm going to run it through a neural net that, uh, you know, at X at the input has the, the input size of your data set. Uh, I'm going to compress it down into this latent dimension, right? So all these, these, these trapezoids are just neural nets uh, with, uh, decreasing numbers of nodes. So uh, I can start out here uh, with, a, um, you know, I don't know, nodes equal to the number of, of features in your data set, maybe even more. You can go wide and then come down. But ultimately, you want to compress it down into some low dimensional space. Uh, and then you have your decoder, which then expands that out, which is, does the reverse operation uh, back into the dimensionality of your input data. Um, and so what you want to do, uh, how you, you set up your loss function is you want to minimize the difference between um, your input and your output, so which they call the the reconstruction error. Um, and uh, yeah, this seems to uh, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of different um, ways that this could be used. So um, one thing is uh, for anomaly detection, you could use the autoencoder to look at um, you know anomalies often have higher reconstruction error. Right, so um, you don't need any supervised data. All you're doing is trying to learn how to run this through a uh, neural net. Um, yeah, you can use uh, you know, the reconstruction error to help uh, detect anomalies. You could look at plotting the latent dimension. You could do analysis on the latent space. Um, there are versions of autoencoders called variational autoencoders that try to learn not just projecting, but actually try to learn a distribution in the latent space, uh, which are generative models. So you can actually then, if you can learn a distribution in the latent space, you can generate data from it. So they're pretty, pretty interesting. I haven't used the variational versions uh, too much, but you know, just standard autoencoders are you know, pretty good for, for um, latent space uh, estimation, dimensionality reduction. Um, so, that is the uh, conclusion, you know, again, very high level about supervised learning. And if there's one thing to take away um, is I think that these models are only as good uh, as their usefulness. So again, what is a good supervised learning or unsupervised learning model? Um, yeah, it's really difficult to define. Um, and so when you're testing something, if somebody comes to you and says, I've got a great uh, super unsupervised learning model, um, I'd be, I'd, I'd be very interested in how they defined, uh, you know, great or how they define the performance. Um, so I think it's often just, you know, how are you using this in your, um, um, you know, in your work? Um, so for, uh, going back to the credit card fraud, when we divided up the customer base, ultimately what we did was then built, uh, um, fraud detection specific models on each of those clusters. So we could say, well, and honestly, it was, the results were kind of mediocre. Um, you know, we, we had a much smaller data set. Maybe we weren't building as good of models, but sometimes the uh, performance on some clusters significantly outperformed a model, like a generalized model. Sometimes it didn't. Um, yeah, there's lots of different ways we can use um, uh, unsupervised learning. So... Um, mostly, like I said, I think of it as an anomaly detection problem. Um, anomaly detection can also be characterized as a supervised learning problem where I only have one class in my, my training set, but you know, I don't know that, you know, now we're talking about 
blurring the lines between supervised and unsupervised and what does that mean? Um, so again, I kind of already mentioned uh, semi-supervised learning. Um, how most of this goes down, so there's a great survey that kind of summarizes a lot of this. Um, but if I want to think about a generative modeling approach, um, you know, kind of one of the most basic, yes. Again, a couple of Absolutely. Great. Uh, okay. So first comment is uh, clusters obtained by uh, Tisney have no significance, mostly used for visualization. Also for reducing it to more than two dimensions, it takes forever due to underlying maths. Reducing them more than, yeah. So I would agree that generally, well, you can take, yeah. So just implementing Tisney is a dimensionality technique. It's not a clustering technique. So it's mostly used for visualizing data. Now I can take that, that reduced dimensionality and then cluster on that. Um, so we're, I'm essentially using two different unsupervised learning algorithms, which sometimes can help. Um, you know, and also sometimes can help just to visualize. Um, so what was the second part of the question? Uh, Oh, just, uh, it said, uh, for reducing more than two, yeah, it just takes forever. Yeah. And that, that probably has to do with some of the, uh, the hyperparameters, right? Since it's using a, a gradient descent method, um, you know, so if it's taking a really long time, I don't know, maybe go in and change the hyperparameters. Uh, I'm not sure how much the, uh, uh, how sensitive the results are to those hyperparameter settings, but, um, you know, it kind of depends on the data. That would be one solution. Yeah. More comments? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, someone else said, uh, I'm using BERT, B-E-R-T embeddings as an encoding method for traditional machine learning tasks like clustering and classification. Uh, they capture complex and contextualized features of language and compared to traditional text embeddings like B-O-W and word to vec mm -hmm. they can be seen as a form of dimensionality reduction. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with all of the um, underlying math of BERT. I know that that is what I would say state of the art, right? So be a bag of words is what I was describing earlier, where you take all of the, uh, you basically define a dictionary and, uh, um, uh, you know, basically, uh, count the words and, and fill in a, a matrix that way. Um, but yeah, BERT is, um, there's a lot of different ways, uh, to, to look at embeddings and representations, um, if we think about deep learning algorithms, um, you know, everything before the clustering is, is kind of like an embedding. All it's doing is a whole bunch of transformations. Um, I guess, what, what was the other part was something about this bag of words and what else? Uh, word to vec. Yeah. So word to vec was pretty interesting. Um, Again, I don't understand or haven't really looked at all of the, the math behind it. I don't do a lot of natural language processing. Um, but essentially what it did was it was able to convert text into um, uh, uh, vectors, but the vectors had meaning. Um, and so you could add vectors together uh, and then interpret, well, what is this uh, uh, addition mean? And it had some type of relevant context in, um, uh, uh, in language. Um, I think that was one of the examples. Eventually, I think it, it kind of started to break down, but word to vec is another way of representing uh, language as this, uh, uh, um, as a mathematical vector and maybe even reducing it. Um, yeah, so a lot of the, the NLP stuff comes down to, um, but still, word to vec, uh, at some point you're taking your, um, you know, your word and uh, your token, uh, what they call it, and then uh, put it into some type of vector where it's just a, a, a very sparse vector where, where, you know, a one indicates the presence of this token and everything else is zeros. Um, and you run that through. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's been a lot of unsuper... Yeah, Disney's been, like I said, I've, when it, where we've used it is um, uh, analyzing some financial documents and looking at where do they lie uh, uh, in the, uh, 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 Tisney space. Um, more recently we're looking at, um, metadata of catchments. So hydrological data, uh, trying to understand how close these, um, uh, uh, catchments are to each other. Um, there, that's kind of interesting again, where we're, you know, we're really struggling with how many, um, different catchment types are there, um, uh, trying to get that information from, um, hydrologists, but it's still going to be pretty hard. Um, are there more, more comments or questions online?
No, nope. all right, we're great. Um, yeah, so uh, semi-supervised learning is, uh, yeah, trying to maximize the log probability of um, the inputs and the outputs, having, uh, uh, you know, one distribution uh, and balancing that with the uh, 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 log probability of the, uh, the unsupervised data. Um, haven't done much with, with semi-supervised learning, but... Um, yeah, there's a good survey uh, from just a couple of years ago if you're, you're interested in that. Um, again, one of the, the resources I use for this, um, Elements of Statistical Learning, um, it has great um, chapters on clustering, hierarchical clustering, all the math behind that stuff. Um, and so I'd highly recommend this, uh, this book if anybody's interested in more, more detail. Um, so any final questions before we move on to uh, a quick uh, Jupyter Notebook demonstration about some, some unsupervised learning techniques? All right. Yeah. I'm not sure how to I was wondering if there's anything you could say kind of a priori about the statistics within clusters given a method. Like you said, you had some weird set of data that you couldn't pick a one, you know, statistical distribution that fit, but you wanted to cluster it so that they would each cluster this Gaussian or something like that. Could you, is that something you could do? Uh, yeah, so that would probably be like a variational autoencoder. Okay. Um, and so what the, what the variational autoencoder is going to do is try to learn, it's going to assume like some type of distribution in the latent space right. and then try to assign um, or cluster into a latent space where everything follows like some type of Gaussian. And what's trying to actually learn in the, in the latent space is not, like I said, it's late, you know, the, the, the parameters of that distribution. Could you yeah. pick the distribution beforehand yeah. and say, I want to select, I want to partition this data so that yeah. the clusters are Gaussian or, or some, you know, some arbitrary distribution? Maybe? Um, I think there might be some constraints on how you solve it. Um, because it uses, so variational encoders use variational inference. Um, but yeah, I think you could just define which, uh, uh, which distribution it wants to learn. Now, how complex the, the math gets and everything, does everything simplify into a nice a square peg round hole thing? Is gonna try well, I don't know. I know Tisney definitely won't do it. Um, I would, I would, I would explore variational autoencoders. That would be my guess, uh, or some other type of of um or something along that space and i'm not sure right because essentially what you're doing is putting some type of other constraint on on what you want your um uh latent space to look like yeah so yeah definitely variational encoders. i guess there is no loss function for some reason right um define that constructor trying to think i don't have a lot of hands-on experience with the the variational versions um so i don't know how that changes the architecture um so yeah i'm not i'm not quite sure how to answer that okay. um but um i bet that there is um i wonder if anybody's thought about that because I, I don't think that there's any Right, because the general formulation of a variational encoder would be learn a distribution, right, some probability, and then you can just def you know parameterize that in some way. Right. So it seems like it can be done. I'm not sure exactly what what the implications are. Right, yeah. it's like trying to force the data into a distribution or just discover one that naturally fits the data. And yeah. To that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the yeah, I guess the advantage of the variational stuff is that you know you can then maybe interpret these things. And again, it's a generative model. So I can now generate, um, you know, examples, right. That theoretically aren't in my data set, but could come from, from this distribution. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's see. Get this a little bit bigger. So I did some unsupervised learning on, uh, the Parkinson's data set that we used, uh, for the, uh, uh decision trees. Uh, I got a link to the data. Um, so I'm going to use uh, principal components, TISNY, K-means, um, and uh, 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 actually, oh, so um, 
something that's interesting. I didn't really like the uh, the clustering, the hierarchical clustering algorithm that's in, or maybe it was the dendrograms, but I didn't like the one that was in um, Scikit-Learn, so I'm using the one from SciPy. Um, just a quick note about uh, Python, um, and generally the, these packages in general, uh, check the implementations. Um, you know, these things are open source. Um, I've had different people come to me and say, well, um, you know, Things like, oh, well, the uh, ordinary least squares uh, implementation in this package like gives me different things than what I've seen in R. R has, uh, you know, an actual repository where people check for correctness. So um, I would say check uh, these things. Um, always be skeptical about implementations that you find in Python. Um, so using the Parkinson's data set, again, this is... Um, Data where we're taking, you know, recordings of, of people talking, uh, extracting features from it, and then um, uh, trying to detect, you know, the original objective was to detect whether or not they're, they have Parkinson's disease or healthy. Um, I don't think that this really, I, I really picked this data set because, for this part, because it's small and, and kind of interpretable. Uh, we don't really get very good clusters from some of these things. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, Again, and also when we look at the, um, we know that there's two clusters. When we look at the data, um, it's not very clear um, necessarily that there are multiple clusters, at least from these um, um, histograms. So, all right, a lot of times, how do we pick, um, uh, um, you know, the number of clusters is looking at the distributions and you can see multiple modes. Um, so um, that's one way, I guess, you know, so if I look at something like, this plot, like I might say, well, maybe there's a cluster here and maybe this is another cluster, but this could just be, you know, a property of the data and the way we sampled. So, um, very difficult again, kind of, uh, again here, right? So we, we see this dip at, at this part, uh, whether or not this is just an artifact of the data set we collected, or if there's actually two different clusters here, um, a little bit up to, to interpretation. Uh, it's why, you know, unsupervised learning is so difficult. Um, so let's start with principal components. Um, so, you know, there's a pretty, pretty simple uh, implementation in um, uh, scikit-learn. Uh, one of the things I always think is great, like says the explained variance, so you can understand exactly how many components you think you should need or how much the, uh, basically how much information are you losing when you compress it to a lower dimensional space. This can be uh, told by the, so we took those 22 features we ran through principal components, uh, plotted the explained variance. It's very, I would say, clear that um, at least two principal components can explain probably 90% of the variance. Um, if we go up to three, we're probably getting 99%. Let's see. Yeah, probably. So... Um, and we can also look at the cumulative sum of those. This is another... Instead of a scree plot, which just shows the uh, uh, explained variance taking the sum, uh, so we can see right when we get up to the three, going beyond three doesn't really have much of an effect on explaining more of the variance. And then I plotted uh, the first two so we could start to look at some visualizations. Um, and I went on and color coded it based on whether or not the uh, you know the patient had Parkinson's disease or is a healthy patient. Um, and we're not really seeing much in in this space. Um, so, you know, this is one of the challenges of, of unsupervised learning, which is that like, you know, we're explaining a lot of the variance, we're compressing the data. Um, you know, we aren't running a clustering algorithm yet, but it's not really showing that this, you know, at least principal components is not really uh, clustering the data in a way that we think would be very interesting. Um, but we do see some anomalies. So I'd be really interested to know, like, well, like, what, what is this group of patients right here? What is that group of patients? Um, so if there's some interpretations that this is what I like to use principal components for is often to, you know, maybe sometimes as an exploratory data analysis tool. Um, I went on and printed, you know, because the, um, uh, you know, explained variance shows that like three uh, principal components is, you know, explains most of the variance. So I plotted it in three dimensions to see if there's any difference, but not really detecting much here either. Um, when I use TISNY, um, Again, it's kind of interesting that we're now we're getting three, uh, I would say, relatively distinct clusters, um, but still there is a, uh, a mix of 
of patient health state, right, in, in each of these clusters. So it's not, you know, we're, we're seeing that the data is naturally uh, um, um, grouping in these different latent dimensions, uh, but it has nothing to do with the label. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, also interesting that, you know, we have this kind of other cluster right there. Uh, and again, if you run this uh, multiple times, um, you know, you'll get different, you know, this uh, one, one big thing, right, is that every time I run principal components on this data, th this is the plot that I'm going to get. Um, every, but every time I run uh, Tisney, unless I, nope, I didn't do it. I'm sure there's a way to set the, uh, the random seed here, but I didn't do it. Um, and so every time you run this, this plot is going to look different. Um, so there's a couple ways that we can use that. Some people look at that as a flaw. I like to, I like it, uh, because what I want to know is that like, well, how robust, um, is this to essentially initial parameters, right? So if I only get a good clustering, like for a very small set of parameters, like how much information is there really in that? Um, so running, running these probabilistic algorithms multiple times and not necessarily understanding that you'll see different information, different results, but you know, the conclusions hopefully are robust to something like this. And that's the sign that you're really learning something um, um, that's interesting. But I don't know, even looking at this, you know, sometimes I look at the location. So we see here that at least the, uh, if we look at this cluster, at least the, the um, what are these? these are the healthy individuals are down this lower corner where everybody else is up there. But in some of the other clusters, it's all intermingled. So um, um, again, one of the challenges of this is, is is this useful at all? Yeah. Run Tisney on this data set again. Are you going to like the, the quality that there's three clusters? Is that going to be reproduced, or could it be totally different? It could be different. Um, I think when I ran this multiple times, it seemed like it was always three, but or or three to four, but like they're going to rotate, right? So their their locations might be different. Um. Yeah, so I've seen that a couple times, right? Is that yeah, you know, hopefully, right? If it's if 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 there is really like three clusters in this latent space, it should show up. I said the locations and the actual uh, uh, um, you know values of these dimensions will probably change. So right, if I ran it again and I saw like eight or 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 saw like none, I would be very skeptical about whether or not this is a valid result or or how robust. Right again, generalization. So. If I go out and collect more data, how much does this change? Um, so that was dimensionality reductions, looking at some other clustering. Um, here's the code to create the silhouette plots uh, for k-means. Um, so I, I did a lot higher than what we saw. Um, so here, actually, yeah, this is an interesting one where um, uh, this is... Um, yeah, actually showing like a negative distance. So this is, you know, oh, I guess the, I think I generated in the slides, I think the silhouette plots were not from this data. They're from that, that very, that, the generic data set that I made of two clusters. Um, here we're looking at, we, again, we know that there's two, right? Um, but it's kind of interesting, right? So this silhouette plot shows, you know, a lot of mass right here, right? A lot of mass of this, this cluster is above the average. Um, but I don't know. I'd probably interpret this as being like, there's not, not, there aren't two clusters, um, is how I would interpret this. And we know that there's two different, uh, um, types of patients. Um, I think where, you know, so if you get down some of these, again, picking the number, maybe four looks like it's okay. Um, maybe higher, but just able to show, um, yeah, you can produce a lot of these. Again, I don't really use these very much. I don't really, um, uh, like how to interpret them. Um, again, you know, I would say that if you go up to something like this with nine clusters, you're probably, you know, now you're over specifying everything, right? We know that there are, I don't know, maybe there's nine different types of, I don't know. this is where you need some type of metadata maybe on each of the patients, right? So maybe it's not, you know, how well is, um, um, you know, those voice recordings and, and the information of those recordings actually indicating something about um, their, their health status. I don't know. Um, yeah, generate the elbow plot, which we've already seen, um, generated. Okay. So here, what I did was I, I implemented the K means, 
uh, and then um, uh, reduce the dimensionality uh, using uh, Tisney um, and uh, color coded uh, based on the, the K means clustering. So what we can see is that K means, right? If we give it two, uh, then reduce the dimensionality, right? We, we, we pick out that, that cluster. Uh, and as I start to increase, um, you know, the clusters, it starts to kind of fill in. Um, and so K means is, there's kind of some relationship here between this latent space and what K means is learning. Um, so, so I often like to try to combine maybe, you know, some type of clustering algorithm with some type of dimensionality so I can at least understand. Um, again, it's really hard to interpret. I mean, this is a, let's see, one, this is six. So it seems like at least that there are, you know, it's learning something, right? There, there, there's some type of connection. Again, how do we use it? Don't really know. Definitely think that that seven is too many because what we're starting to see is so at least this cluster they defined it first. Now it's starting to find that those are a different uh, different cluster. Um, use hierarchical. This is kind of hard to see. I'm going to blow this up. But if you can kind of see at least what we're seeing is that what it's doing is at least like kind of grouping, um, you know, Parkinson's kind of in a, a, a healthy, uh, right? So it's not really intermingled, right? We're seeing at least some types of, of clustering here. Um, you know, again, kind of on and off, it seems like definitely we find one cluster right there of, of, of healthy individuals. Uh, and then finally, you know, kind of the same way with the trees. We can, we can basically prune it so we can get it down. And this is now telling me how many observations are in each of these. So now I've picked and said, well, show me an addendogram with a depth of six. So I'm saying six clusters and, and we can use this. Uh, we can maybe even use, you know, some of those labels to understand. So um, we're about out of time for this session. Um, it's a quick overview of unsupervised learning. Again, um, yeah, it's really hard to evaluate, hard to, to understand, but it is a tool. Uh, and so when we come back, um, we'll start a little bit. I'll give everybody, you know, 15 minutes for a break. Uh, we'll conclude with reinforcement learning. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, We'll start the final section of the course today, um, specifically focused on reinforcement learning. I've already talked a lot about uh, RL, um, shown some videos, uh, but now we're going to get into some specifics. Um, I'll say this is probably the most uh, math algorithmic heavy uh, part, um, just because in order to understand um, reinforcement learning, we have to understand the underlying model uh, for this, which is a Markov decision process. Um, and so I guess maybe if, if people are, anybody familiar with MDPs? The, it's kind of a classic OR uh, type model. Um, I'll say just the study of, of uh, MDPs by themselves and what is called dynamic programming uh, could be a class unto itself. Um, and often um, it can be, and maybe to really grasp exactly what is going on here, you might need that level of knowledge. Um, the reinforcement learning can be a whole nother class uh, without even getting to kind of the most state of the art methods. Um, so this is a, a huge field and I'm just trying to, to give a little brief introduction of it um, um, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, inspire some interest in the field. I've got some great resources. Um, like I said, David Silver, who we saw in the Star uh, StarCraft um, um, video has a lecture series. Um, it's actually now on the, it's on the DeepMind uh, homepage, but you can go get the slides, you can go get the, the lectures. Um, and it's really great if you wanna uh, really understand exactly what is going on with some of these, these terms that we'll be talking about value functions and policies and everything. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just try to, like I said, set the stage a little bit, kind of what I've been doing with the unsupervised, uh, um, uh, uh, supervised lectures, which is like, if there's one takeaway, uh, I want everybody to understand that if you're gonna be implementing 
this uh, this class of algorithms. If you have somebody that comes to you, you know, if you're in the test community and you need to evaluate um, a um, a reinforcement learning algorithm, the first question I would ask is, uh, what is your your Markov decision process? Can you write that down for me? Uh, and if they can't, they haven't probably thought all this through. Uh, and what I usually see um, in, in in academia is maybe people trying to jump right into implementing these algorithms and not always thinking about whether or not um, their problem that they're trying to solve fits into a reinforcement learning algorithm and how you can model it as a, a Markov decision process. Um, yeah, so that's often where we get stuck, which is that they want to, you know, people want to implement reinforcement learning. Maybe they see it, uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, like, is this a reinforcement learning problem? Is this a control problem? So, um, right, the defining characteristic of problems uh, that we want to use reinforcement learning to solve is that they're sequential control problems. So at each step, I want to decide how to act. Um, and I want to do this sequentially. Uh, often the the characteristic that I think about is like, why would I want to use re, uh, reinforcement learning is, is there, are there situations where I might want to make a suboptimal action in the near term in order to put me in a better position uh, uh, at the end uh, or, or further down the road that will have a giant payoff. So if you think about chess, like, you know, sacrificing pieces, right? That's a classic, like, you know, if I, 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 I maybe get uh, a, a very, you know, I get negative reward, right. For losing a pawn, but uh, I made a suboptimal action in the near term if I'm only looking one step ahead. If I look at the game of sacrificing that pawn lets me capture a queen, it's a big payoff. Um, so sequential to control decisions. Um, in this case, instead of uh, a label, we have a reward signal. Um, and uh, also the reward could be delayed. So if we're thinking about um, uh, games like chess, right? Um, the reward signal or kind of a, a canonical example of how do you, uh, you know, bad reward signals versus good rewards, right? I could make a, a reward function that assigns all the, uh, um, um, pieces on the board, uh, numerical values. And I say, you get a reward as you capture pieces. Um, but capturing pieces isn't really the, the objective of the game. The objective of the game is to checkmate the king. And you can checkmate the king by not capturing any pieces or capturing a very small number of pieces. So uh, one trade and one thing you need to be thinking about uh, if you're designing these algorithms is what is my reward signal? And you can de design a reward function um, that ultimately is not aligned with what you want to do. So a lot of time goes into the design of a reward uh, function. Um, I guess we saw it in the video with the uh, uh, hide and seek, right? Is that, and you can also underspecify, right? So if you just say, well, win the game, right? It's going to find, uh, you know, in that case, it's going to exploit physics uh, based uh, exploits and uh, yeah, just win the game. So uh, the reward, it can be delayed, like I said. So if we're thinking about a game of chess or that hide and seek, right? Those action, the action of stealing the, um, um, uh, that, that ramp, right? You don't actually get an immediate reward for that. You get the reward at the end of the match where you see that you've won the hide and seek match. Same thing with chess. So uh, we've got to think about how, how do we, I don't want to say back propagate, but essentially equate like some reward signal off in the future to a specific action that we took in time. This is how we, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's one of the challenges of this. Um, it's sequential. Um, and also that our actions not only impact um, the um, uh, the reward that we get, but also the state in some way, right? So our state is back, actually the information that we're acting on. Uh, when we take an action, it impacts the environment. Um, so uh, in chess, if the state is the location of all the pieces on the board, I'm going to choose an action, which is to move something. I have now changed uh, the, uh, the state. Uh, and this change can also be probabilistic. Right. So in, in games, most of the time, um, well, if we think about how are we uh, modeling this, but your uh, your opponent's action could be uh, modeled probabilistically. So I made a uh, I chose to move a piece, uh, but maybe the next state is actually after they move. And that is maybe probabilistic. Um, so. Like I said, in order to understand reinforcement learning, we 
the the underlying model is a Markov decision process, and we need to understand these components uh, so that we can formulate. Uh, you know, if we if we can't write down these components in a problem, uh, and we can't define these things, you can't really implement a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so, an MDP is divided into um, basically five different components. We have our state. Uh, this is the information that we need to act. It should encompass theoretically everything that we need to make decisions. Um, and so the construction of a state space can also be uh, a challenge. Um, what information do we want to put in the state? Uh, what is relevant? Uh, if our model is performing suboptimally, is it because we're not giving it the correct uh, state information? Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions around what is the state? Um, there's the action space. Um, here I have it listed as uh, a discrete set. Uh, this can actually be continuous also. Uh, it doesn't have to be discrete. Usually we think about it uh, at this stage, uh, learning about MDPs as a, um, um, uh, as a discrete set. So taking an action, moving a piece. Um, I'm trying to think of other uh, examples. You know, mostly, mostly I'm going to think about games. Uh, cause this is really, you know, it's re really easy to conceptualize as a game, right? Which is moving, uh, uh, maybe moving a piece in chess. Um, there's the transition function. Um, and so this defines, um, how the environment evolves. Um, so if you're familiar with, um, Markov, uh, processes, uh, Markov chains, the Markov, ch you know, it's, it's a Markov chain where there's kind of like, you know, this, this action concept, right? So if we, we get rid of this, the, uh, the action right there, then you see that it, it's, it's just a Markov chain, Markov probability, uh, uh, Markov decision processes just have this other, uh, uh, aspect of an action where the action, uh, defines the state or, or the, the probability of a state transition. Um, and we're also assuming, uh, which is why it's named after Markov, that it has the Markov property, which is that uh, the state transition is only dependent upon uh, the, the current state and not any of the uh, information uh, uh, beyond that or, or in the past beyond that, right? So that my, my next state is only dependent upon my current state and it has nothing to do with where I was beforehand, or at least we're making that assumption. Again, we've talked about assumptions. Uh, you know, what are, what are we breaking? Is this actually the case? This is the assumption that we make um, uh, in, in, um, markup decision processes. Um, so we have higher order processes too, but in reality, um, with all the algorithmic, um, influence of, of, um, the, the algorithmic power of reinforcement learning, I'm not sure that really matters. You could also construct a state space that possibly has information from the past in it. Um, so, there are ways, you know, modeling ways to get around that. But essentially what we're, we're assuming is that my next state is only dependent upon my current state and the action that I took. Um, and then we have a reward function where the reward function is going to be conditioned on your uh, current state and, and the action. Um, and it's actually the uh, expected value of, of the reward signal. Um, and this is the feedback that we get. Uh, and then finally, we have a discount factor. Uh, and the discount factor is really more like a hyperparameter where what we want to do is, you know, this is essentially, um, uh, it's essentially, tr uh, you know, trying to weight how much information in the future, uh, we are letting influence. So at each, um, uh, at each, um, uh, iteration, we're going to discount, right? If you think about time value of money, it's the same principle is that that rewards that we see further in the future have less impact uh, on our current decision than, than, than immediate rewards. And we can control that trade-off uh, through the, uh, the discount factor. All right. Uh, any questions about this uh, before we move on? These are the, the basic, you know, this is what we'll be talking about a lot uh, uh, in this formulation or in this lecture. Okay. Um, so another concept that is not directly related to the components of the MDP is now the policy. And ultimately the policy is what we want to learn uh, uh, or we want the reinforcement learning, what I'll call agent 
learn, which is how to act in the environment. So if we look at the policy, I have a, uh, you know, represented by pi, uh, saying that it's the, uh, uh, this can be the, the probability of taking action A given state S. So, um, you know, the interpretation of it is that this is telling me, you know, I have it written as a probability uh, because, you know, this would be like a, a um, uh, you know, probabilistic policy. Uh, it's pretty easy to simplify this to a deterministic policy with a probability of equal to one. But, um, yeah, usually this is the most general form. So what we're thinking about is, um, yeah, we want to um, learn the probability that I should take an action given a state. Um, and we usually think about this in terms of prob probabilities because if we think back to, to this, we've got probabilistic transitions and probabilistic rewards. Uh, so um, we, you know, we might end up learning a deterministic policy, but in reality, given you know, there, there's plenty of situations where uh, a non you know, probabilistic policy is is optimal. Like I said, or talked about a little bit with, um, uh, you know, especially in the face of adversaries. So you don't want to be too predictable, um, right? And so, usually when we think about data. Uh, or, or some type of representation about what are we actually going to learn from? We're learning from the sequences of states, actions, and rewards. Right? So that, those are the tuple, uh, if I'm thinking about data, that we're going to learn this policy from. And so what the policy is doing is it's influencing the, uh, uh, the action that I take. Right? And then I get a reward, uh, and then the state transitions. Um, so... A key concept um, to a Markov decision process um, and to, to reinforcement learning is um, the value function. So how do we start to estimate, um, right? So we, we looked at, we want to learn, uh, we, we get a reward signal. We want to learn a policy. How do we start to um, quantify um, uh different actions, right? So if we think back to, to, to this policy, right? There's, there's a number of different actions that we could choose from. How do we start to assign value to each of those actions so that we can then think about it in terms of a, a, a probabilistic policy? And we do that through a value function. Um, and so the first term that we want to um, define is what's called the return, uh, which is defined as G of T. So at time T, uh, the return is now uh, the reward at t plus one plus the reward at um, uh, you know, a discounted reward at t plus two. And actually, I, I left off. There should be another plus sign and all the way out to infinity. Uh, right. So this reward should basically go theoretically if we have, um, let's see, MDPs that have uh, what I would call uh, uh, end states, right, that end uh, like a game uh, goes to the end of the game. Theoretically, you can have an MDP that never ends, um, doesn't have an end state, doesn't have a reward state, and then we can model it out, out to infinity. And actually, the, the objective, one of the objectives of the discount rate is to make it so that things that go all the way out to infinity uh, basically have no contribution. So eventually, it's, it's you know, a, um, I wouldn't say like a cheat, but a way to get around uh, uh, infinite horizon MDPs, which is that eventually that, that factor is going to go to zero. So, because what we do is that in each step in the future, we um, uh, uh, use that as the exponent. So, we can now quantify that if I have that if I can actually observe that uh, my uh, agent acting in an MDP, which we'll usually call an episode, um, if we can observe an episode out to infinity or out to the end of the game, we can quantify uh, the reward or or the return. Right, which is the sum of all the rewards. Um, and what we're going to do is we can think about two different types of value functions. Uh, the first one is the state value function. And the state value function is the uh, expected uh, return um, from a state under a, a, a certain policy. All right, so this is now what, what do I expect to see uh, if, I'm in, if I'm in this state this current state, and I'm following uh, a policy, pi, uh, and moving forward. What is my expectation of, of uh, reward? 
uh, fu expected future reward. Um, then we also have the state action uh, value function, which is just now what is my um, expectation, uh, uh, expected reward of being in state S and taking action A, uh, and then following the policy after that. So I can now start to, these are, are, are concepts that now start to quantify uh, the value of taking different actions or following different policies. Um, so what do we want to do? Uh, well, I guess before we get to that, a little bit more math. Um, so if we think about the value function, uh, we defined it earlier as being this, this uh, um, return. Um, if we think about the return, um, we can decouple. These are called the Bellman equations. They're pretty uh, essential to, to MDPs. But essentially, we can start to break up um, the, uh, um, uh, that return into um, uh, different components where we can say, well, it's actually my reward um, from being, you know, my, my immediate reward. Plus, instead of saying that whole string of other rewards, it's actually now uh, the value of being in the next state. Actually, I'm going to use this real quick. Use this? You good? All right, so if we have, right, so R t plus 1 plus gamma of R of t plus 2 plus so on. All right, so this is really just g of t plus 1. If we look at that equation, um, discount, right? So it's, 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 if we look at right, our, our equation from earlier, let's go back, right? So R of T plus, or, gamma. yeah, yeah, gamma, using shorthand, there we go. Um, right, so this is really, So what we see is that we can actually embed right, that, that all this other string can actually be the return from the next state, uh, which then allows us to write shorthand instead of having to write that out in, in uh, this very, very long sequence. We can just say, well, um, it's actually it, it's the, the expectation of the immediate reward plus the discounted value of the next state. Um, and ultimately, you know, again, I'm going to not go through all these derivations, but what we can do is then write this as, um, right, so we get the immediate reward plus some transition, right? So getting to the next state is probabilistic. Um, we can uh, sum over the probability of getting that reward uh, in that second term up there. Uh, and then also we have to sum over the probabilities of taking different actions. So we can... Right, the expectation in the top line, which can actually be decomposed now into the second line uh, for the, the state value function. Um, and we can do the same thing for the state action value function. We actually usually call this, uh, we'll start calling this the Q function um, because we'll talk, or start talking about later what's called Q learning. But um, we can get the same concept. Um, so this again is kind of classic MDP uh, dynamic programming type equations, but it all comes down to uh, the fact that when we solve an MDP, what we want to do is find uh, the value function, you know, uh, a policy that maximizes this value function, right? So now we're able to, if we think back to this, right, we're able to assign values of being in states and, and following policies. We're able to assign values to being in states and taking actions, then find policies or, or then uh, following policies after that. And what we ultimately want to do is um, uh, learn policies that maximize our value, um, which is often called like right, expected future reward. Right? So as we think back to the definition, right? The um, right the definition of a value function is uh, you know the expected return of being in a state. So I want um, to. Right, find a policy that is going to maximize my expected return. Uh, and equivalently, we can find the, the max Q value, which tells me exactly how to act. So, um, 
again, we're still not quite to reinforcement learning. We're still in dynamic programming. Um, and essentially what the difference between uh, these two things are that um, if we know all the components, right? If we know the transition function, we know the reward function, the MDP is not huge um, in terms of like how many states, how many actions there are. Um, we can use, there's a lot of classic dynamic programming problems or, or, or algorithms where we can find numerically the um, optimal uh, uh, value function and hence the, the policy. Um, now, uh, these things tend to break down. Like I said, if, if, you, don't, if you don't know the uh, transition function, um, you, you can't implement these. Or even if you know everything, but it's huge because you have to enumerate all the different states and all the different actions usually, um, you can't, you know, it becomes uh, computationally infeasible to, to implement these things. For, so for a long time, I said that MDPs have been around for a long time. Um, a lot of effort has been put into solving them using dynamic programming. Um, but um, yeah, very computationally expensive. Uh, policy iteration and value iteration are two examples. Um, but yeah, have to be small and you need to know all the components. Where reinforcement learning comes in uh, is when maybe either the MDP is huge uh, and I need to learn from experience, or um, maybe I don't know. Or actually, most of the time, uh, reinforcement learning assumes that you don't know anything uh, ab or, you know, about the transition function, and I don't know anything about the reward function. All of that is, uh, if we go back to this, all of that stuff is basically encapsulated and hidden in the environment. So instead of saying, well, I know all these uh, map, you know, all these components, I can enumerate all this stuff essentially using uh, value iteration, policy iteration to uh, estimate some value and derive a policy from that. Uh, what I'm going to do is just interact with the environment. Uh, I'm going to take actions. It's going to, you know, basically all that is going to be hidden inside that black box. And all I'm going to see is the next state and the reward. And I'm going to try to learn stuff from that. So, um, yeah, and that's really the breakthrough uh, of RL, which is that we can start to solve MDPs without doing this. Now, the downside um, is that, uh, yeah, we need to be able to have um, uh, interaction with the environment. Um, so, um, yeah, trade-offs, right? Don't need to know so much, but I've got to be able to, to, to have an environment. I guess, you know, and... Last note I have here is that right uh, when I talk about large MDPs, I mean even moving to to continuous state spaces, right? So I've been talking about everything in terms of a a, a discrete set of states, a discrete set of actions. Uh, um, RL is is really good for for continuous state and action spaces. Okay, so one of the classic um, examples in in uh, for MDPs is what's called grid world. Um, and, uh, it's used a lot in a lot of different contexts and reinforcement learning and stuff. Um, and because it's so, so simple, uh, and it's pretty easy. It's, it's the, uh, we got an agent here represented by this man, uh, and they want to try to get to their home, uh, up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and now I can solve this with an MDP or you can formulate it as an MDP. Um, so first of all, if I want to think about the state, um, all the information that I need to make decisions is my current location. So I can just make it the X and Y locations. Yeah, I mean, you might want to add in, well, are you at home yet? Um, maybe that's embedded in someplace else, but um, yeah. Yeah. One simple concept for the state of this is uh, the location, X and Y coordinates. Uh, if you think about the actions, um, you know, it's pretty simple. I'm going to assume that it's just the cardinal directions up, down, left, and right. Um, you could increase the action space by adding diagonal actions. Um, or, or, and I'm also assuming that I'm only taking one step, which you can make this much more complicated by increasing the, um, uh, the, the complexity of the action space, make the, the grid bigger. Um, transitions, at this point, we're going to assume, it, assume it's deterministic. Um, so the probability of, you know, I'm going to look at, you know, if I choose, if I'm here and I choose my action to be moved to the right, 
uh, I'm going to move to this square with probability one. Um, so it's deterministic. Um, there are plenty of grid world examples that are non-deterministic, and what you can think about is like, well, maybe there's like uh, some breeze, right? So I decide to move one step over, but maybe, you know, with some probability, the breeze catches me and actually pushes me over there. Um, so you can model this thing in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, the rewards, uh, again, so what do we want to do? Um, we want to get to uh, the home in as uh, few uh, moves as possible. So in this case, uh, the reward is going to be negative one each time I take an action. So why do I want negative one? So right, if you think about if I want to maximize reward, um, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, reward doesn't always have to be positive. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to get to uh, my home in the, 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 the fewest number of steps. Um, and uh, yeah, for a reward of negative one, will uh, uh, achieve that goal. Um, right, because if I go, you know, meander off, I'm just increasing, you know, negative reward. Um, so that's, that's often a concept that sometimes um, trips people up when we are uh, implementing these things is that reward, you know, it, it's all relative, right? And, and the scale of reward doesn't really matter, right? I could multiply this by, um, you know, 100, right? If I give you a, a reward of negative 100 each time, uh, everything just scales. So, um, and then finally, I don't know. Again, discount factor is basically a parameter that you can choose. In this case, you know, we're not looking at uh, a lot of uh, future, um, you know, future reward doesn't really matter that much. I really want to think about, um, uh, yeah, I just picked uh, 0.99. Give me an example. Actually, you probably pick zero. Uh, or 0.01, something really small because yeah, it doesn't really matter um, for something like this. So, um, right. So the concept, so those are kind of the, um, you know, five components, right? Now we've broken down grid world into five components. Um, you know, the other things that we've thought about, right, is the, the value, right? So now my value is like, well, what is the value of being in this state? And how, again, I'm not going into all the, uh, the math, if you go look at David Silver's lectures, he does a grid world example where they actually solve for the value function. Uh, and essentially what you'll see is that uh, my value uh, is going to get closer and closer to zero as I get closer to the, uh, to the home. Um, and so that's how I can decide, right? And so what I want to do is when I'm thinking about a policy is, right, I want to uh, move in the direction that's going to give me the most value, right? So, um, yeah, again, it's, it's going to be negative, but... You want it to be, you know, you want to move in that direction, right? So the value uh, on this grid world, the 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 um, uh, the smallest value, right? The most negative value is going to be right here at the start state because this is where you are, the furthest away from your home. And as you get closer, it increases. Um, and so essentially, what we do is, uh, you know, very simply, we'll learn a policy that looks something like this in the end. Right, which says, again, this is why it's probabilistic, right? Because there's really no difference between being there or there because um, of just the way it's set up. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, probabilistic actions, probabilistic uh, policies are pretty good, except to take it to the edges when there's only one way. Um, so, as I said, this is very simple, um, but a lot of, uh, you know, work, great papers have been derived from this simple example of grid world. Like I said, we can we can uh, expand this in significant ways. We can make the the uh, the space huge. Uh, we can have an adversary in here, right? That goes around and tries to block your position. Um, you could have uh, um, walls that block things. Um, you know, we, we people have looked at studying. Well, what you know? How quickly does your agent relearn if I like move the the home, or if I put up a wall someplace and they can't. Uh, move. So um, there's a lot that can be done with this very simple example. Yep. Questions online. Uh, yep. <clears throat> from on <clears throat> from online. Uh, reward maximization can be uh, misunderstood as reinforcement learning, as it is not necessarily optimizing the target. Um, I 
Yeah, quite a question mark. Uh, wait, can you repeat that? Reward, um, maxim- reward maximization can be misunderstood in RL as it is not necessarily optimizing the target. Um, well, I guess reinforcement learning is the process of estimating the policy. Like the reward maximization is like your objective. Um, so if I'm sitting, if I'm thinking about, uh, RL, right. So in, in supervised learning, right. We thought about objective functions about minimizing, um, uh, loss functions in RL. What we want to do is maximize, uh, expected future reward, right? That that's our objective. Um, and then RL is a way to learn a policy that meets that objective. Is there, if there's any follow-up on, online, let me know. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'll say, you know, we, we thought about tests a lot. Um, maximizing expected future rewar- reward is one objective function. Um, there's a whole area of RL called safe reinforcement learning. Um, which tries to put some constraints on this. So what I could think about is maybe maximizing, um, what's it, maximizing expected minimum reward, right? So that way I could think about, well, what is like, you know, the minimum reward I could try to get from this? Or maybe, you know, it, you know, you could think about other objectives. So usually safe RL has to do with two things. One is maybe changing or constraining the optimization function in some way to, to constrain your agent. Another one is maybe to put giant penalties or, or changing uh, the exploration um, uh, policy. So um, I think we're about ready to get into RL. Any other questions about the concept of MDPs or value functions or anything like that? Oh, right. right. So, all of that was just, like I said, primer for, for, for RL. So if you watch David Silver's lectures, I think he spends like two or three lectures total just about MDPs and, and dynamic programming. Um, so what we're going to try to do is estimate that value function uh, by repeated uh, um, actions in the environment, where what we're going to do is we're going to observe our state, take an action, and receive a reward. And from that process – we are going to estimate those those value fun- the value function and the state value function. Mostly, what we're going to actually be be um, estimating is the uh, the state value function or the state action value the Q function. Um, but what is key to this concept or the to RL that's different from dynamic programming beyond just um, you know the fact that we're we're not going to have access to all the components of the MDP is um, uh, we need to explore uh, uh, the, uh, the space. Um, we need to have some type of randomness in our, um, uh, when, we're, when we're interacting because we don't know, um, let's see how to say this, like we, you know, we might find some actions that start to give us reward um, and we could completely exploit that. Right, and we could follow that policy, um, and we might never even encounter like maybe there's this whole other actions, you know, th- this set of actions over here um, that gives me some type of giant random. So if we think about uh, the hide and seek uh, example, why did it take uh, millions upon millions of of examples to find those actions that give massive reward? It's because uh, 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 you know. Uh, we're, we're randomly exploring the space and that prob, you know, the probability of taking a random action is pretty small. Um, so that's why we want to do it is because eventually if you keep running these things, maybe we'll stumble across some action that is way better than anything that we've seen. And so sometimes you'll see that is that if you track like expected future reward, uh, sometimes it'll start off and it'll go like this and then it'll sit and it'll plateau for a long time. Then all of a sudden it'll jump. And what will happen is that all of a sudden, just like they, you saw in the uh, 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 the example, it found some exploit uh, in the physics, and all of a sudden, it said, "Wow, like this works way better." So, you know, this type of of um, uh, if you're tracking your your loss or expected uh, reward uh, is pretty common. Um, now, a giant question is how long do you have to run it, um, and that's you know always a, a question with these things. 
Um, so um, exploration is a key concept. Uh, often we think about it in terms of exploration versus exploitation, where exploitation is I'm going to take actions that give me the most reward right now. Um, and, and exploration is being, well, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try some random action. Um, so there's a couple of different general ways that we can do this. We have a completely random policy. Uh, most of it starts off as being completely random, right? Cause we don't know nothing about the environment. Uh, I'm going to set, if I take the probability, you know, probability of any action, it's all going to be equal. So I'm just doing random stuff until I start to receive reward and updating my, my policy. Um, so you could completely explore at random. Um, you could have a specific exploration policy that you set to say, this is how I'm going to explore. Um, and what's mostly used is what's called uh, epsilon greedy policy. Um, so uh, an epsilon greedy policy says, well, with probability one minus epsilon, I'm going to select the optimal action, right? Using pi or, or maybe the value function in some way. So I'm going to follow the optimal action. Uh, but with probability epsilon, I'm going to select one of the non optimal actions. Um, and you can set, again, epsilon is like kind of a, uh, um, is a hyperparameter that you can set, uh, to tune, uh, your, your exploration. Um, actually we'll see when we look at some of the algorithms, a lot of them start to decrease or change epsilon as we, we learn. So, uh, but you know, it can have a pretty significant impact on your algorithm. It's one of the tuning parameters. Um, so, Whenever we are implementing RL, we need to explore in some way to try to figure out if we're basically stuck in a local optimum. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with one of the, the – what I think is one of the most interpretable um, um, RL algorithms. Um, it's not often used uh, because – well, one thing that you definitely need is um, uh, it's not very efficient. Um, and if I remember correctly, I can't remember if this one, either it was high bias or high variance. I can't remember. Uh, if you go look, so um, this book, Reinforcement Learning, um, is, you know, if anybody's interested in this, along with the David Silver slides, um, I would highly recommend that book. Um, it lays out all this stuff and it, it'll give you a great base. Um, and it'll, I, I think that they talk a lot about the, 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 the variance and the bias of these different algorithms. So, um, but I think this one's pretty easy to start with. And what we're going to do is we're going to sample K episodes. So in an episode is going to be a, um, uh, a set of trajectories through the state space, uh, basically until the end. Uh, like, so, so basically one gameplay, think of the episode. Uh, and what we're going to get is we're going to get sample an episode uh, where we get, you know, these sequences of states, actions, and rewards over and over again uh, using uh, some exploration policy. In this case, we're going to use uh, uh, the e-greedy policy. Um, and then for each time t, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each time we see a state action pair, we're going to increment one. Uh, and then we're going to update our q function um, by saying, well, we're going to take... Um, the difference between our expected return and we can uh, calculate our expected our, our return right value from this episode. Um, and I'm going to take the difference between uh, the return uh, for a state action pair uh, and the difference between what's my current value for Q, which is the, the estimate. Uh, and then I'm going to normalize it and I'm going to add that. Um, yeah. So that's it. You just keep generating these episodes. You keep cycling through all of this. Uh, you do this for each each uh, t, uh, each time step in your observations, and uh, eventually, oh, and also this right. It, so here we are at each k decreasing our our epsilon, um, and this will converge to uh, what they call um, uh, what's it, glee. So this is what, um, uh, yeah. Uh, that says uh, the question is: uh, Should the subscript be one on R following the a sub one and step one? I guess because you, yeah, it looks like yeah, s sub one, a sub one, and then it's r yeah, sub no, two. Uh, well, it kind of doesn't matter, but most like so. I'm trying to follow the notation that's in that David Silver uses, and I think that's in uh, the the intro to RL book where they think about the reward coming in the next state. All right. Um, yeah. So I, 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 it, 
I don't think it really matters. Uh, maybe, well, let's see. In the algorithm, does it? I might need to change T's someplace. Because uh, if we look back at how we defined the return here, right? So G of T is actually looking at reward at T plus one. Um, but, you know, the actual value of the subscript doesn't really matter as long as everything is consistent. Um, but, yeah. So, um, yeah, so if you think about this, if anybody's familiar with, like, gradient descent or something, um, right, you can think about this as, like, well, um, what I got? I got, like, my target. I got the difference between my target and my uh, uh, model output, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, going to adjust my estimate uh, based on some scaled factor of that. We're scaling it basically on how many times we've seen this. So, um yeah, and actually this is called like the temporal difference. Um, and there's a lot more to this algorithm that I've skipped over in the uh, 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 trying to get through uh, uh, everything we want to get through. But yeah, um, it's very simple. Um, I think the main limitation is that this only works for finite MDPs. So you have to have episodes that end. Um, and you also want to make sure, you know, and if your episode takes a really long time, this might not be the optimal algorithm. And usually this isn't really implemented that much anyways, but I think it's the easy place to start. So what is like one of the most popular is Q-learning. Um, and so um, here what we're going to do is um, instead of estimating, right, the return, right, we're going to use that property uh, that we, we discovered earlier in the Bellman equations where we can actually, instead of saying the return, we're going to take the immediate reward and then I'm going to look at some estimate of the future reward. And so actually what we're doing is we're taking the um, uh, the um, uh, max Q value over uh, from, from the next state, but over uh, all possible actions. Um, so, and this is also, we don't need um, uh, the entire string of rewards, right? So essentially what we're doing, right? Since we're using this estimate from the next state, all we need is, is tuples of, um, I think this is state action. So what do we need? We need current state, the action, um, and the reward, and that's it. Because what we're doing is taking the uh, uh, state action value from our Q function, which we already have. So this seems a little recursive, and it can take a lot. You know, It's really good to maybe go implement some of these and see how things evolve, because it's really not very intuitive that you start off with like, you know, Q being all zeros or Q being some random stuff, but this does uh, eventually converge. Um, so there are um, one algorithm that I left off is called SARSA. Uh, and SARSA comes from state action reward state action. So you get tuples that look like that. Uh, here, Q learning, uh, yeah, you just need the, like I said, you know, most of what we're going to learn from is, uh, um, you know, state action reward pairs, which is what we have here. Um, so this is probably one of the most popular um, uh, algorithms. Uh, and, um, yeah, any questions about those those two? Those are just two basic ones. Um And yeah, we're still not quite to what state of the art NRL is, but I think we're going to that next. Um, so what I've been describing so far is what I usually call of it called tabular methods, uh, because what we're doing is you can think about the Q function or, or the value function. You want to think about the value function. You can think about it as a vector. Uh, the Q function you can think about uh, as a matrix, where each element in this matrix is if I have, you know, J actions and I states, um, each element in this, act, uh, uh, right? So uh, the, the Q value for uh, state one, action one, uh, is up in the upper left-hand corner, and we can fill everything in based on that. Um, so if uh, the state action space is small, it's pretty easy to, 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 to fill this in. Um, <clears throat> Again, so you see how um, 
uh, things can evolve. Um, you know, implementing some of these algorithms, if you want to implement them, you can watch the Q values increase. It's pretty easy. <coughs> um, and I've got some code that shows some, um, some of the uh, uh, easier implementations of these algorithms. But um, this has some limitations. Um, first, it's, you know, relatively small state and action pairs. Um, right? I mean, I think that we can go up pretty high, but still, it's, it's not continuous. Um, so there are some limitations to the, these tabular methods. Um, and really what this was solved from about eight years ago uh, was combining reinforcement learning with uh, deep learning. Um, and one of the first papers uh, defined what's called like uh, deep Q learning, deep Q networks. Uh, so what we're going to do is that in, in, in tabular methods, right, we're trying to populate this table. Uh, in deep learning algorithms, we're not going to learn, we're not going to fill in a table, but we're going to learn a uh, function that approximates those values. Um, so on the input side here, um, now we got to think about the state uh, is actually a, a, a feature vector. Um, so maybe there's... Uh, uh, you know, it, so going back to grid world, we can leave it as like, you know, the X and Y tuple. Um, but let's say that we can uh, first off describe our state uh, as a feature vector of X. Uh, and what we do is we take X and we input it into the neural net. And uh, on the output side, instead of outputting Y, it's going to output uh, an uh, uh, estimate of the Q function uh, for every action. Right, so here it says, well, if I'm in state S, tell me, estimate uh, what you think the um, uh, state, state action value function is for each possible action. And then I can choose actions by taking, taking the max. Uh, so, um, yeah, it allows me to now have continuous state and actions. Well, I guess at this point, I don't think we're at continuous actions yet. Right, because it's still we need to enumerate it based on the uh, um, uh, nodes, but we can now have continuous state spaces, right? Because these can just be any value. Uh, and what this does is also allow me to, you know, uh, if I have now continuous, I can kind of think about, well, what, a, what, you know, if this trains properly, if I've created the state space um, uh, in an adequate way, I might be able to predict uh, actions or the value of actions in a state I've never seen before, right? If there's some relationship between the states, right? If all of these state uh, values are, um, uh, uh, you know, if they're correlated in some way. Um, so that's one of the big advantages. Now, I don't need to explore the entire state space. Whereas if I have this, uh, you know, a tabular method, if it's huge, uh, let's say like I can, I can get big enough that I want to, want to uh, actually try to approximate this. That means I've got to go and explore each one of these state action pairs multiple times to actually get a good estimate. But now, uh, you know, I can actually, you know, it, it, if this is actually learning a good uh, a policy map, a good um, a, a deep Q network, um, I could get estimates of, of Q function values for states I've never seen before, never visited before. Um, and so this is really where state of the art, I mean, this, well, this is actually eight years old, uh, but this was really one of the giant breakthroughs that led to things like, um, uh, you know, all the advancements that we've seen is that now we don't need to, you know, if you think about what they're doing in Starcraft, how do I even start to enumerate a state or an action? I need, I have to have something like this. Um, so this is the original deep Q. Um, again, we're still at discrete states or discrete actions. Um, what we can do is instead of predicting the value of each, uh, of each action, um, I can go directly to predicting an action, uh, in which case, 
I can now have continuous actions, or I can maybe even predict over probability. Actually, usually that's the, you know, so I have continuous action space. Usually what I want to do is predict, uh, you know, a, a mean value for it and actually sample from, from that. But uh, now we can really start to, um, uh, I would say, push the bounds of where we can go uh, uh, with this. Um, and there is all kinds of different algorithms that, that have um, uh, spawned from this, or not just from this, but from everything else. So we haven't even gotten into, there's, there's all types of, of algorithms that have to do with multiple Q networks, uh, uh, Q networks that are deciding about different things. There's uh, actor critic methods uh, that have shown to be extremely powerful. Um, yeah. So again, we're just touching the surface, but this is kind of where I wanted to end up, which, which is that this is where, you know, usually when we're talking about, you know, uh, even if we, even if we can enumerate a state in action space into a tabular method, most, most stuff is now, uh, um, yeah, you are leveraging some type of deep learning. Um, now, uh, I got a book at the end of this that I'll, I'll recommend for everybody. If you want to try to implement this stuff, uh, because there's lots of, of, um, of issues, I would say, uh, uh, that you need to address. Uh, one of which is now, you know, the, the dependent structure of all the data that you're seeing, right? So if I have these state action pairs or state action reward pairs, um, uh, yeah, that, that, those aren't IID samples anymore. And IID samples really affect, uh, the learning process of a deep learning algorithm. So, um, there are, uh, yeah, I'll recommend a book at the end. Um, so what are some issues with, um, uh, deep learn or reinforcement learning in general. Um, one is that it starts with a naive policy often. So we're starting from scratch. That's why it takes so long. Um, that's why you can have, you know, if you're, if you're tracking this, you can take millions of iterations before it even does anything that looks reasonable. Um, you know, when we looked at the video, uh, of the, the hide and seek game, right. They were talking, you know, it took, you know, millions of iterations just to get to the basic point. Then it took hundreds of millions of iterations to go for this because, you know, and what they should at the beginning, right. It was just the agents kind of running around. That's why it takes so long is because eventually what happens is through this just random exploration, some agent did something that allowed them to win the game. They got a reward signal. They updated the policy slightly because I'm have a combination of exploitation and exploration. I'll do something that's close to that again. Uh, and maybe I'll see a reward or not, but that's why this takes so long. Yeah. Could you start with a non-naive policy by pre-training on like humans doing the thing or something like that? And then, you know, that way you've got some intuition in your, your starting point. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, we tried it. Um, surprisingly, it didn't really converge to an optimal policy. I wonder if it's because you are biasing. Well, <laughs> biasing, but again, it's like, well, if I have, so... <clears throat> you could think about it in ways of, so there we were looking at controlling, it was, I think like flood drains or something uh, for like a, a civil infrastructure system. Right. And we were really looking at, well, we kind of know how to, um, uh, you know, control these already, right. People do this. So why shouldn't I be able to start with that? Uh, and kind of what happens is like, maybe you're um, uh, biasing the algorithm in some way. Uh, are you really exploring enough? Um, yeah, so what we found is that it can still converge to a good answer, but sometimes not the optimal. Yeah. I think uh, a random policy ended up working that any starting yeah. point would work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you have to, um, you know, tweak the, um, uh, the, the epsilon parameter a little bit more, right, in the epsilon greedy to make sure you are actually exploring the, the space enough. Um, yeah, that's something that I've often thought about. Or even, well, what happens if we you know, train in the simulation and then, you know, convert, you know, put it out in the real world and then try to uh, get it to work. And I don't know, a lot of people don't want you to like try rent, you know, uh, uh, reinforcement learning on real things because um, yeah, you don't know what it's going to do, especially if you have like a, uh, you know, you say, yeah, it's going to take a random action at some point. Yeah. So it yeah. sort of goes along those lines and you do not want to do reinforcement learning unless you're out in a real field. Have we, do you know of any uh, action plans you have that don't like same exploration? Like, yeah, intentionally taking suboptimal actions 
you may want your car to, if a uh, self-driving car to take a different route, then that might be best. But you don't want the van to decide to drive onto a sidewalk yeah. just to see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's like what part of the, the safe RL field looks at, which is like, well, right, I don't need to crash my car to know that that's bad. Um, and I can probably build that in. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's been a lot of, I think this is a really underexplored space that's very relevant, you know, to the DOD, um, and, and, but not really eye catching in terms of like academic publications or something like that. Right. Um, right. So again, the, the, the hide and seek game is really cool. It shows the extent of these algorithms. It doesn't affect anything real. Right, kind of the same with that. And that's my main critique about a lot of uh, what RL has been used for, which is that it's the most advanced um, implementations and kind of you know theoretically, uh, uh, you know what's been shown to be the most impactful really has no real world impact. Um, and it's because we have all these limitations, like you know how do I get you know RL to you know, if it takes me a million iterations to even get something that is not completely naive, um, like what do I, you know, like how can you even get to that point? Or if, yeah, you know what, I do know something about, right? So tabular methods, right? I can go in and probably start to fill in some of these. How do I start with this? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, so maybe there's training. So I think it's a, it is a space that's really interesting um, and really underdeveloped. Um, so, yeah, I'm very interested in it. We've been trying to. I said our our little bit of uh, maybe we were choosing bad starting policies, um, but yeah, it kind of showed that like yeah, what we're doing is kind of limiting maybe the max policy that we could get to. Um, right, the the most rewarding policy, um, but yeah. I definitely like to keep doing this. Like, so we've thought about transitioning from, um, simulations. Um, you know, how do I calibrate this? Can I let like, you know, the RL agent query, like a person to ask them about their input, um, you know, before I take an action that might be unsafe. Um, so there is like said safe RL stuff, but I haven't seen much, uh, uh, recently. Yeah. <clears throat> Know right. you want to conserve energy, you also know if you don't want to drive on the sidewalk, you can sort of yeah. in some fashion. Yeah, but it seems like it doesn't give us the the optimal thing. But you know, but maybe that's where we need to be. So that's where I think that you know everything that's being done as like state of the art and and really being pushed out and like getting a lot of academic you know, if you go to any of the top uh conferences where like RL is going to be be shown that they're probably not addressing that. They usually think it's like too operational too engineering focused um, for, for, for cutting edge research, but I really like it. Um, and I think that, that is a big goal. So, right. So you need, right. It starts off with a naive policy. Um, it needs to be able to interact with an environment that can also be very difficult. That's, you know, yeah. Let's say we could set up a safe space, uh, you know, and, and we aren't going to crash the car. Every episode is going to take a really long time to generate. Uh, and then to reset and stuff like that. So if you need millions of these interactions, how do we do that? Um, right. Long training times. Um, and then also, you know, you got to construct the state in the action space. So that's why I would say that like, you know, if you're, you're evaluating some of these, the, you know, somebody says that they have a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, I really hope that they have really good answers to what's the state in the action space. They usually have to have it. If they're doing deep RL, um, you know, they, they kind of need to define this stuff, but um, I don't know. Like I said, I, I feel like, you know, you, you've got to have these, these qualities, like, um, you know, not, it, it can't just impact the next state. It's got to be, or, or it can't be totally greedy in terms of, I want the most reward right now, because that's like a supervised learning problem. I can just say, pick the optimal action. So, um, yep. So those are some things. So I mentioned this before, if you want, um, Right. So here's the link to David Silver's lectures, which I would highly recommend right here at the bottom. Um, this stuff is, uh, you know, he basically is based on the, the intro to reinforcement learning book uh, written by Bar Barto and Sutton, uh, which is a very classic text. 
this is going to give you a lot of theory, um, a lot of explanation about uh, those Q learning stuff. Um, it's going to talk about deep RL as value approximation or, or, or value function approximation, because uh, we don't necessarily need to use a deep learning model. We could use like a linear model or something else. Uh, but really, the big advancements have been uh, the deep neural nets. Um, and then if you want, I don't know. I, I mean, this book, I would say I bought it two years ago. And some of the code started to be out of date then. So if you want a hands-on tutorial, it's a good book. And I'm not sure if you go and download any of these repositories, if they're going to continue to work or not. Uh, I was having issues with it. But what I think it does do is it, and where it, it builds on the, the uh, Bar Barto and Sutton book, is that this really does focus on kind of the modern stuff. There's a whole chapter on deep Q learning and all of the things that, that you know, the tweaks to the algorithm um, that have uh, 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 made it evolve and made it really robust. So including things like double Q, where I actually am learning two Q networks and one is really old. And that is actually uh, what I'm using to explore the space. I'm not using the most up to date. So it prevents some overfitting and stuff. And there's a lot of cool variations. And that book does a pretty good job of explaining that. Um, but again, I said two years ago when I tried to download the code, some of it already was kind of out of date. Um, and then what we'll look at, I'll pull up the Jupyter notebook is, uh, uh, gymnasium. So this is, I think this is open AI. So the same people that did, you know, um, uh, you know, chat GPT, the, uh, in space, but it used to be called AI gem. Now they call it gymnasium. This is a nice place to grab some environments and, and some implemented, um, uh, uh, RL algorithms uh, where you can start to play and understand like, how do I need to code stuff like this? Um, so any questions before we transition to a short Jupyter notebook about uh, blackjack? No. All right. Anything online? Nope. Great. So um, here is the uh, a blackjack, and but this is a basic very simple example. Um, it's actually based on one of the tutorials that's in gymnasium. So here um, is the gymnasium homepage. You can see that there's lots of like classic control problems here. Um, this is a uh, lunar lander, um, where you want to try to, the control problem is actually trying to get the lunar lander, I think to land inside those flags. Um, so, and there's lots of other stuff, um, that they have over here on the left. You can see uh, a lot of Atari games. Um, so uh, actually a lot of the original breakthrough of, um, uh, deep RL was done on a whole suite of Atari games. Um, and yeah, yeah, it talks about all the different APIs, uh, but essentially it comes down to being able to define an environment and then have an agent be able to queue that environment, uh, and get, um, states and actions from that. Um, so uh, and then the specific, uh, blackjack example that I based this on is also referenced right here. So you can go see that. Um, and, uh, if anybody doesn't know, I think this is the, uh, basics about blackjack in general is everybody know how to play. You get cards, you try to get to 21. Uh, it's kind of a classic MDP example. Um, if you look, I think, uh, um, silver has a bunch of, uh, examples in his about how do you estimate the value function of different hands? Um, so, uh, what I start off with is just, right. I, um, right. So this is a built-in environment. Uh, in gymnasium. So I can just call Jim uh, and say, make uh, the blackjack V1 environment. Um, often what you need to do is reset it. So this is going to give me the state and info. And then I printed some of the initial um, uh, state information from this. Um, so what it gives me is the, um, uh, the value of the player's hand. 
uh, the value of the the card that the dealer is showing and whether or not you have a usable ace. So that's the the state space for this. Um, the action space is pretty simple. I can get it from the environment uh, just with this action space command. Um, and it's basically, you know, a uh, uh, stick or hit. So do I want another card or not? Uh, right, so the state space um, here it is actually uh, enumerated. Um, so I wonder why. Oh, it goes up to 32 because I think that's possibly the max value that you could have in your hand. You know, you'll lose the game, but it has to have something to say, okay, this value lost. Um, the, the dealer's hand goes from, uh, you know, uh, has 11 different values. Um, and the usable ace rate is also discrete. But this is like, you know, so we, we talked about uh, on um, uh, deep learning, right, now having these different features of the state space. So this state space has three features. Uh, and they're all discrete and enumerated. Uh, right. And then the reward comes down to, um, you know, if you win the game, you get plus one. If you lose the game, you get minus one. Uh, if you draw, you get zero. So pretty easy. Uh, like I said, um, you know, we could scale all that scale. The reward doesn't matter. Um, uh, the, right. And what they have, right. Is, uh, for the reward range, they have it, you know, uh, it's infinite on what you can have, right. So you could build, you know, theoretically, if you won, uh, you know, Numerous games in a row, you can build up your reward space to be whatever you wanted. But those are just some of the, uh, uh, I would say, um, things that define the environment that we can get from uh, this environment um, um, object uh, that's available in gym uh, or gymnasium. Um, so uh, what I can do is... Um, First off, just by uh, uh, generating um, uh, a state and action space. So I can take the environment, I can take the action space, and I can sample from it, right, to get an action. So that's what this command is here. Uh, action space sample. Um, I printed it. So what it's telling me is that when I sampled it, it's action zero. So that one is, what did I define that as? That is stick. Um and then what I can do is, is call this step function on the environment, give it the action, and it will output uh, my observation. So it calls an observation. So one thing I didn't really uh, uh, talk too much about uh, is that what we've been looking at, we've been talking about the state uh, in these MDPs. Um, you can have partially observable MDPs where you don't actually get the state, or you're not observing the state, you're observing some type of observation, which is correlated with the state. Think of it as equivalent to like a hidden Markov model. Um, but you know, ultimately I don't think it really matters for these types of RL because it's still just a state signal and there's noise in that. Uh, I think it learns over that. All right. So what it outputs, uh, if you look at the, the documentation, it says it outputs the observation. So that's essentially the next state. Uh, it's going to give me a reward. Uh, it's going to tell me whether or not, um, the game has ended. It's going to give me a function not terminated. Uh, I don't remember what truncated or info are, um, but I just want to show that, you know, it outputs other things. Um, I guess to do with, with state information or something that's not relevant. But one of the main things that we want to do, one of the main functions that we want to leverage is the step function. Um, and then um, I'm going to build a, an object, a class uh, that represents the agent, right? So this is now... Uh, Everything that we, uh, you know, this is, includes the learning algorithm and the policy. Uh, so I'm going to start off by initializing some parameters, the learning rate, um, uh, the, the epsilon for the, the epsilon greedy exploration, uh, the decay rate of the, um, let's see, wait, where's the decay come in? Oh, that's for the, uh, how, how I'm decreasing uh, epsilon over time, right? If you think back to the, Q learning algorithm, I think, yeah, this is Q learning, right? It, it, it changes epsilon over time. Gamma, the uh, discount rate. Um, I'm initializing uh, the Q table uh, as just zeros uh, and then starting off with some iteration counter. Um, and I've defined a function for action where, again, you see the um, epsilon greedy, right? So if, um, if 
some random value is less than epsilon, I'm going to sample from, uh, or take a random action from the, the uh, you know, randomly select an action. If not, I'm going to choose something from the Q table. Uh, and then here is how I'm updating my, my Q function. Um, so the difference between these two lines is that, right, if I'm at the end of the state, right, if, the, if, if, it's, if it's done, I have no um, next state observation. So all I'm doing is looking at the reward I received, uh, uh, and the difference between the reward I receive and the, the value in the Q table. Um, this is the, the classic um, Q learning um, uh, equation that you that I showed in the in the slides. Uh, and then yeah, then I've got a function down here to decay epsilon over time. Um, so that's the agent that we need for this. That's it. Again, I'm doing Q learning, so or you know, it's tabular, not doing a reinforcement learning algorithm, just so this doesn't take that long to train. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this is the training loop. So I'm gonna train it for a uh, hundred thousand episodes games. Um, I start off by oh, it's got a nice wrapper that lets you record a lot of the uh, uh, um, performance measures, statistics from this training process. So that's a nice feature in gymnasium. Um, I'm going to iterate over the uh, the episodes. Um, at the beginning of each episode, we got to remember to reset the environment, right? So this is kind of initializing a new hand. Um, I have the action, uh, the agent taking action based on the observation. Um, step through the environment, uh, then update Q, and then determine whether or not the the, the game's over or not. And that's basically it uh, for Q learning. So um, yeah, we can, we can, yeah. And then at the end of each episode, I decay uh, epsilon uh, and that's it. So pretty simple code in terms of, uh, you know, these algorithms. And what we get at the end is, uh, you know, I'm just tracking reward over time. I've got some, some code here to, to, to clean this up. It's all, you know, here uh, uh, explanations can be found in the, um, uh, you know, on the website uh, for this demonstration, but, you know, basically it converges, um, you know, pretty quickly in terms of RL uh, to some type of, some type of stable policy. Um, remember, blackjack is always in favor of the dealer, so my, obviously my reward is negative, uh, but, you know, we can look at this, uh, we can look at the policy. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it, this seems very simple, but remember, a lot of the code is being hidden in the fact that gymnasium has this nice environment set up, right? So if I want to implement something uh, from scratch, uh, I've essentially got to build this, but now I can build it in this, um, you know, I could, I could build objects uh, that look like this, that, that represent this. And there's probably built in code for, for different types of algorithms in gymnasium. Um, you know, but I could build my own environment uh, uh, in the gym, you know, as long as it, you know, I have a function in there that that steps that that initializes and resets everything. Uh, it'll probably connect to a lot of this, but you know, that's usually you know I, I talked about um, you know the importance of getting data labels, collecting data uh, in RL. It's it's building this environment. Um, it's 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 making sure that this. Um, um, environment represents reality thinking about things like the reward function um i'll tell you that the reward function is uh you know you can really get some interesting emergent behavior by selecting the the wrong reward function or a reward function that doesn't align with what you want the agent to do um and i've also seen things like this is a very simple reward function you know i mean it's very clear what um uh what you want this agent to do um, you can engineer very complex reward functions. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot more in this uh, in this space. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, you can. I think what it's actually going to print out in this case is a dictionary. Uh, that, that's the way it's built in or in this code, because what it's doing is, you know, it's, it's not building the entire Q table. It's building a dictionary each time I see a new observation. 
that I haven't seen before and adding it. But yeah, you should be able to print that out. Uh, you see it. Yeah, it builds it on the fly. It builds it on the fly. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's just the way that, you know, I'm following the the example uh, on the uh, web page. I mean, we could very easily um, do that. It's probably a memory saver, uh, right? I don't need to build out the whole, but I mean, well, this isn't that big anyways. Um, I guess also what you would need to do is build a, um, you know, initialize with a matrix that is, you know, 32 times 11 times two in terms of the uh, number of rows. And then you've got to build a function that then maps whatever this, you know, your state is, which is a tuple into which row. Um, so, yes, but yes, you could, you, you, you won't see um, the, um, the exact, um, you know, a matrix like I've been showing, but you'll, yeah, it, it definitely has the ability to print something out. Um, so, right, if you also look at, <clears throat> right, so when I'm referencing here, right, so I'm saying, self Q table, right? This observation. Um, so, uh, right. And that's just the dictionary. Yeah. Um, but again, this is also just what I'm, you know, I'm just following this example. Um, I made some minor, minor changes, but um, yeah. And there's a lot more examples. Uh, you know, I just picked blackjack because it didn't take that long to train. Um, I think the lunar lander one and some of the Atari stuff, um, you probably need to implement some uh, deep learning algorithm. You probably want a, uh, uh, a GPU. So I've seen, um, you know, this was several years ago, but we had a student that was trying to implement some of the Atari stuff. Uh, trained for several days without a GPU. Uh, never converged anything that was, uh, you know, remotely resembling a smart or any type of intelligent agent. We threw it on a GPU and it worked overnight. So, um, yeah, this trains very quickly and why I, I decided to use it for, for this. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> for the execution part, do we save the policies? Well, the policy is derived from the QT. Um, so, yeah, so we're not really learning a, a, like, so if we look at the agent and, and it, you know, it's, it's all the, um, you know, the policies all derive from, from the Q table. Um, cause what we do is if, if it was in actually a matrix form, um, so if we go back to, to this, um, we don't, I mean, this is essentially the policy or we can derive the policy from this. And so how you do that is, you know, if I'm in a particular state, I go to that row uh, and I look over all the possible actions and I select my action to be whichever has the max Q value. Um, so yeah, we don't often learn like a policy necessarily. Yeah. Uh, how do we implement the learned model when testing? Um, so if we go back to this, uh, what I would do is just change the uh, um, the get action. Um, so if you want to put another if statement in here uh, and get rid of that random part, right? So if you're just using this uh, part from the the else statement, so how can I turn on the there we go? Uh, so if you just use the um, uh, the code in, I think it's 19 and 20, um, then, right, so all that's doing then is is, is being a completely uh, uh, greedy or, or, or complete, you know, not exploring at all, right, completely exploiting the policy. Uh, and so that is how you would um, uh, ch test the agent, right, so get rid of the, um, uh, get rid of the, the exploration, and then also, uh, stop updating Q. All right. So if you want to fix your, um, so if we go back to, to this part, um, <clears throat> comment out line 20, right? So I'm, I'm not updating my policy at all. I'm not exploring at all. 
Uh, all I'm doing is seeing how the agent uh, um, performs in the environment under a fixed policy. Um, and uh, yeah, you could set it for a number of episodes. Um, yeah, I guess you would want to, well, I guess, okay. So you would also want to start, so you want to run this training loop to get the policy. Uh, then create another testing loop that uses the, the agent, right, that we've already learned, we've already trained, uh, and then stop, you know, don't explore and stop um, uh, the updating queue. Uh, but one of the nice things about this is that you can kind of track performance along the way. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, this is really the, uh, uh, the performance of, of this algorithm, right? So it's probably not really exploring too much. It's yeah, basically converged. Um, so um, often what we do uh, in practice is just say, well, you know, I, I trained it until it stabilized and then I just let it keep going uh, for a little while. And I take maybe the last, I don't know, in this case, like 20,000 episodes and, and took the average over that. Uh, but often what we also want to do, so there's not just the idea about, well, what did it uh, achieve? But if we look at some RL papers, we might plot like several algorithms and maybe what we want to look at is, well, not only did it converge to something that's maximum, but oh, how long did it take? I mean, this converges very quickly, right? Within a, uh, you know, less, like less than 20,000 episodes. Uh, I get up another algorithm and actually it has to do a, uh, it took me a little while to reproduce this. This is what's on the, uh, um, uh, on the website uh, because I was trying different ways of updating like epsilon and different um, things. And actually like it converges even quicker uh, if you choose uh, uh, different values. But, you know, I get up another algorithm that maybe, you know, it, it, maybe the, the learning is a little bit more linear or learn slower. So that could be another evaluate, you know, if I'm evaluating an algorithm, maybe not just did it reach the optimum, but how quickly did it get there? Yeah. So something like this that trains really fast, you could run a sample a bunch of different epsilon decays or whatever and, and track, track that. Yeah. Does that. Would that extrapolate to any other problem? Like if you had a harder problem that took longer, how would you, would you be able to have intuition going in about what values to choose or do you kind of just have to start from scratch mm. for every problem? I mean, maybe if it's something similar, yeah. um, but not really. Um yeah, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is a lot of like trial and error in terms of hyper. So I didn't even get into the idea of hyperparameter tuning, um, which is a giant, um, you know, area of research because this is, you know, for a long time, it seemed like everybody was like, well, I'm just going to keep trying different hyperparameters until my conference paper is due, um, uh, which is maybe along the lines of like a random search and a random search seems to work. If you have a really large, like hyperparameter space that results in a good model, a random search works pretty well, right? Just randomly picking things. Uh, you can do a grid search. Uh, there's also like, if you look at, uh, uh, there's also like optimization algorithms that you utilize things like a uh, uh, Bayesian optimization. Um, you train the model to find the parameters for your model. Yeah, so it, it kind of works. Um, there, there's a package called Raytune. Uh, I've got some, uh, I had some students trying to, to implement it, but it it didn't, really, you know, they, the website makes it seem like it's super compatible with everything. It doesn't really seem like it is. At least there, there seems like there's a lot of bugs. But I so said, usually what I think is that, like, um, you know, if I'm doing deep learning, some type of grid or random search seems to work. Kind of the same thing for this, right? Because we haven't even gotten into not, you know, if I'm doing some type of deep learning, yeah, I got to pick the architecture. Uh, I got to pick the learning rate for that algorithm. I got to pick the learning rate for Q learning. Um, there's a ton of hyperparameters, so that's why this becomes even more computationally expensive, right? Not only you know this is, you know, if it takes me millions of episodes to train a single agent, do I even know if that is good? So that's why, you know, when when students actually need to do stuff, we're pushing all this stuff uh, to a high performance computing cluster with GPUs um, and just parallel you know and you can only do that again uh if you have an environment that is um um uh you know reproducible um if i'm doing something you know on a real system yeah how do i even pick the hyperparameters to start like did my model fail because i haven't trained it enough uh did i pick bad hyperparameters what do i want to do um 
So, but there are some things like so there's, there's actor critics. There are things where you, you know, there are ways to parallelize and make things more efficient. So I could have something like, um, I, I can't remember which, I think it's like A3C or some algorithm where you train a whole bunch of different, like basically agents. And at some point, maybe you pick the best one and then, uh, you know, basically get rid of the other agents, reproduce a whole bunch of agents that have that optimal policy or something similar, and then keep going forward. Right. Because, you know, each of those agents, right. It's kind of like bootstrapping, right. They're all just, uh, you know, exploring different parts of the, uh, of the, um, the action state space. Yes. Could you adjust the RL model to incorporate a higher order Markov chain that considers the influence of previous cards played and potentially detect patterns in the deck to adjust its strategy, uh, like through card counting to make uh, better decisions, such as increasing the bet size when the deck is favorable. Yes. I don't know if I, so what I would do, uh, instead of, um, maybe thinking about it in terms of like, well, I'm going to create a higher order Markov model. Uh, I might just augment my state space, right? So here I've got state space that is right. So, uh, players total, uh, dealer shown cards, usable ACE. Uh, I could, you know, so if anybody's seen the, uh, red, uh, uh, bringing down the house or knows about, you know, card counting, you know, you could track something about, uh, you know, uh, uh, face cards that have, that, that have been shown or something like that, right? You can keep that. So instead of making it a, a higher order Markov process, I would add some, I would add a feature basically to the, um, um, the, the state space. Now, um, again, this is all random. This is not a seven deck shooter. So, you know, counting cards and, and, you know, there is, you know, it's essentially starting with, you know, a, a, um, uh, you know, a fresh deck each time. So, uh, yes, but that, you know, theoretically, yes. Yeah. yeah. So again, one of the most crucial parts is, you know, how do I design my state space? What's the information I want? What's the reward function? All of that. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, yeah, this is a lot of fun. I hope you learned something. Um, Again, I'm at the Virginia Tech National Security Institute. Um, we have a lot of people thinking about tests and evaluation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, we, you know, I guess address most of the areas probably that the DOD is interested in, in terms of um, uh, research and interest. So, uh, I hope you have my, my contact info. If not, you can find me at, at Virginia Tech. Uh, but if you ever have any other questions, want to talk about a project or anything else, uh, please uh, reach out. Thank you all very much. Thanks.